The House will come to order. Pledge of Allegiance will also be led by Representative McLaughlin. Mr. Sheeple, please call the roll. Representatives Amabile, Armagast, Bacon, Bird, Bockenfeld is excused, Basenecker, Bottoms is excused, Bradfield, Bradley, Brown, Catlin, Clifford, Doherty, DeGraff, Representative DeGraff, excused, Degree Kennedy, here, Duran, She's so mad, right? English is excused, Epps, Evans, Frizzell, Representative Frizzell, Froelich, Garcia, Hamrick, Hartsook, Hernandez, Representative Hernandez, excused, Herod, Rep. Herod, excused, Holtorf, Judah, Joseph, Kip, Leader, Lindsay, Linstead, right there. Luck, Lukens, Lynch, Mabry, Marshall, Martinez, Marvin, Morrow, McCormick, McLaughlin, Ortiz. Here. Parenti. Puglisi. Ricks. Rutnell. Sorota. Snyder. Soper. Representative Soper. Story. Taggart. Oh, Taggart's excused. Titone. Valdez A. Velasco. Here. Vigil. Weinberg. Weissman is excused. Wilford. Wilson. Winter. Woodrow. Young. And Madam Speaker. With 58 present, seven excused, we do have a quorum. Representative McLaughlin. Thank you, Madam Speaker. First thing I need to say is I'm here to dispel a rumor that is further from Denver to Durango than from Durango to Denver. I just want everybody to know that I happen to come here, but everybody else says, I couldn't go that far. It's just too far in Colorado, but we are still in Colorado and we'd like you all to visit. And they actually have hotels, electricity, and running water. So it's a pretty, I know, highfalutin place. I move that the Journal of Friday, April 5th, 2024, be approved as corrected by the chief clerk. April what day? Oh, she wrote the wrong number here. <laughs> April 12th. I apologize. No problem. Members, you've heard the motion that the journal be approved as corrected by the chief clerk for Friday, April 12th. All those in favor say aye. All those opposed, no. The ayes have it. The motion is adopted. We have a special announcement, members. Representatives Holtorf and Martinez. Representative Holtorf. Madam Speaker, I'd like to make a very important announcement. 
Today, yes, please. Today, my esteemed colleagues, is self-proclaimed National Mr. Potato Head Day. Rep. Martinez. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And we want to thank you all for showing the, the honor and respect of the self-proclaimed Mr. Potato Head Day today. Monica, Monica, can you take our picture? <laughs> Representative Holtorf. Um, thank you, Madam Speaker. We are very, very pleased because of the rile and revelry and excitement of the potato bill and to truly honor the magnitude and importance of the potato bill. Um, we have been gifted and been graced with Mr. Potato Heads at our desk this morning. So thank you to my colleagues who did this for us to really seal the deal on this spectacular moment. Awesome. Representative Marshall. Colleagues, I apologize for the delay, but rather than getting up on third readings, I thought I'd just make the quick comment because our colleagues had brought up the subject of our potatoes. Coming from Highlands Ranch in the suburbs, we didn't think we had anything to do with the potatoes whatsoever. And my I know my constituents, and I know they think they have a God-given right to put anything they want in their property, in their ground, even if it's a Frankenstein potato that will spew spores that will infect the entire human race and turn us into zombies, that is the price of freedom. And the government shouldn't tell us what to do, except make sure they tell my neighbor not to have an ADU. I've heard that. But then I had two constituents show up and make the case. And they made the case in French, English, and Spanish with the instructions they brought and pointed out that potatoes can come in all shapes and sizes, different genders, even different marital statuses. And it impacts upon all of us. So I am going to vote today for our two reps from the rural areas to bridge the rural-urban divide coming from suburbia on steroids for the potato bill. And the only thing I have to worry about now is trying to explain to my wife why I keep telling her I'm doing so much important stuff, I can't work in the yard, but I'm sitting there screaming about how I can put this arm on this goofy toy last night. So thank you. <laughs> thank you, Representative Marshall. All right, members, our next order of business is third reading of bills. Madam Majority Leader. Madam Speaker, I move House Bill 1313, House Bill 1292, and House Bill 1152 to the beginning of the third reading calendar. Seeing no objection, the bills will be moved to the beginning of the third reading calendar. Mr. Schiebel, please read the title to House Bill 1313. House Bill 1313 by Representatives Woodrow and Judah, also Senators Hansen and Winter F., concerning measures to increase the affordability of housing in transit-oriented communities. Madam Majority Leader. Madam Speaker, I move House Bill 1313 on third reading and final passage. Representative DeGraff. All right. Dearly beloved, as we gather today in this Church of Woke to sacrifice our, the rights of Coloradans on this altar of good intentions, it is a privilege to be here to offer some level, modicum, of resistance to bills that did not get any better in the last two days. So 1313, here we are again, more, more moving towards the abolition of private property. That is the goal. So when I look at this map of what is, what is going to be a transit-oriented community, anything within the bus line, within these radiuses, when I look at the, the printout of this, and I know you all got this, it's about, it's about 90, it's probably easy within uh, 80 to 90 percent of all of Denver. So immediately what this means is Every single parking lot is now available for to become a high rise. So we're going to immediately, possibly, 
remove any parking. And, and one of the reasons that we like Colorado is we like the open spaces. And you, have a, and you bring a bill like this in to eliminate open spaces. And we say, well, we want everybody that wants to live in Colorado to live in, be able to live in Colorado, and that's fantastic. But what happens if you create an unlivable situation in Colorado after you've created a zoning, an unsustainable level of zoning? So it's not really even just creating a zoning. This is overriding the zoning. This is, this is going into every single community to ostensibly solve a problem that usually these mostly are problems that Denver has. And then we legislate to impose a in this case, a really bad solution on the, rest of the, uh, on, on the rest of the state. So if we think about any of the parking lots around here, why would they not become immediately high-rise apartments? High-rise, seven-story, whatever you want to call them. There's, they're, they're going in here a little higher than that. So every single parking lot, because now every single parking lot that turns into an apartment complex is not required to have parking. And if you do offer a limited level of parking, that parking can be offered as a premium. When I was in, Colo when I was in New York City for grad school, those slots went for six or seven hundred dollars a month, just the, just the parking slot. So I don't see how we're solving a problem. And then our constituent last uh, talked about the, uh, you know, I didn't look at the volume of this, but the having to change the water lines out from 18 to 24 inches. Well, that's, you know, you think, oh, that's six inches, but if you go by the radius squared, pi r squared, that's a significant jump up in water volume that is required to support this. And then it's also required to support the, uh, the sewer. And then you also need to support the, uh, the electrical. Now, we know that the, uh, based on the, uh, the electrical plans that we have in the state, which are none, that there really is no agenda to have and this, is, and this is kind of proof, this solves the problem. Because if you were to say that everybody would, was going to require an EV vehicle, which lose on average about $64,000 per vehicle by way of subsidies from the government because they are such a bad idea. And of course, those are premised on the, uh, even that is premised on the slave labor of third world countries. So we have bad idea, compounding bad idea, compounding bad idea. And this is a bad idea in terms of what's the goal here? The goal is to make busing, to make mass transit, to make those traffic jams moving in the wrong direction at a lumbering speed, make them cost effective. And how do you do that? Well, in order to make mass transit, so now mass transit, now the people of Colorado are at the whim of mass transit. We want to make Colorado, this body, wants to make mass transit viable. It is currently subsidized at over $2 per passenger mile. $2 per passenger mile, again, a slow-moving traffic jam lumbering in the wrong direction. And that's a perfect analogy for the government this body is creating on a regular basis. So instead of creating a, a system and saying, hey, maybe this mass transit isn't working, so we should do something about it, maybe we could, maybe we could make it more effective, maybe we could make it more desirable, in a typical fashion, in what I would suspect would be a, in terms of policy that would be foisted on a state by statists that that view the state as the ultimate authority, that view the state as the ultimate goal, the, the me true measure of worship in a Hegelian sense, as we're here today, that instead of creating something that people actually desire to enter into on a free market basis in an exchange of good for good, what you do is you, take it, you make it a matter of coercion. So you make it a matter of coercion and you say that the people of Colorado will be taxed and if they don't comply, if they don't submit, if they don't yield, if they don't buckle, if they don't bend the knee to this agenda, then they won't get their, they won't get their tax money back. So, we're gonna, so this bill takes the, takes the money that is extracted from the citizens of Colorado under the threat of force or the actual use of force It's an enslaving agenda. 
That's what we have. That's what you're promoting. And instead of making something that is viable, where people will enter into it in an exchange of good for good voluntarily, again, it becomes a matter of compulsion. And then what, do we, and then what happens with that? What happens when, what happens when you, automatic, you change all of the zoning, just arbitrarily change all of the zoning to match these, uh, these maps to, to comply with this that covers pretty much every place in Denver? every place in Colorado Springs, every place in Fort Collins, and then you put a train from Fort Collins or Pueblo all the way up to Fort Collins. And then, every, and then everything within a half mile of that train line becomes that. Now you're gonna have high rises stretching all the way from Pueblo to Fort Collins, perhaps, until people decide that they don't wanna live here and then we just have this housing bubble that we've created. Who is this a benefit to? Well, largely, I get the emails. It's a benefit to the developers who want to be able to develop on every, every spot that that's, they possibly can, and parking restrictions are in the way. So what do you do? You don't say that, hey, we want to build a, park, we want to build a high rise on every parking lot. You wrap it in some emotionalism, like say, well, this is affordable housing. Well, what is affordable housing? Well, affordable housing can be a, affordable housing can be a luxury apartment based on two incomes as long as it's not 30%. Now, last year, there was a bill that said you couldn't ask for more, more proof than 50%, than half of the income. You didn't have to, re, you didn't have to re, a renter didn't have to show that they had three times the rent. Well, all that, did was, that, all that did was increase the rent immediately because that increased the amount of money available, and then you added, so, so instead of actually solving the problem, instead of addressing the problem, this body, once again, <laughs> takes its status mindset, says what's going on in the nuggets of these individuals here, and it would be cynical to think that they would do this for campaign donations. But this is going to make the problem worse. You don't have the infrastructure available. You don't have the water infrastructure. You don't have the electrical infrastructure. You don't, and are these things, are, these, are those in here that say, before we do anything in a neighborhood, we're gonna require the, the electrical, the sewer, the water. We're gonna require all of these. Representative DeGraff, you have one minute remaining. Thank you. No, you're going to impose this on the state of Colorado, wholly across the board, create a zoning nightmare, all for the good intentions of what you call affordable housing. This is gonna make the problem worse, just like most of the other things in this body make the problem worse. Address the actual issue. The issues are the cost of energy, the cost of regulation. Those are what are driving people out. Thank you. AML Bacon. Good morning, members, and uh, thank you. Didn't mean to take too much time on this bill, and I'd also like to just start by asking just for a little bit of latitude um, from you, Madam Speaker, if you'd, if you'd give, me, give it to me. I just wanted to ask ahead of time. I just wanted to say thank you all for being here on a beautiful Sunday. I know we, some of us may be in church. We were just opened with welcoming to be here in the Church of Woke. I just want to say to you all on behalf of the community that coined that term, the term wokeness is about opening up your minds so that you are able to understand the space that you're in to make conscious decisions and also have conscious awareness of how you might have been socialized to inferiority. And so when I hear that word woke, I do hope that we are able to use that mindset here as we talk about bills and debate them. But also, I just want to note that the opposite of woke or being awake is to go back to sleep. And that is not something that my community opts into doing. And I do not appreciate it being used as a term of derision, particularly as we're debating policy. Thank you for the grace. Thank you, AML Bacon. Representative Holtorf. Esteemed colleagues, Madam Speaker, I didn't have the privilege of being here Friday afternoon as I was driving to Burlington to an event. 
and Kit Carson County. But I did have the benefit of participating remotely um, in that two and a half hour drive within 10 miles of the Kansas border. I did get to listen to the discussion and the debate on this bill. And here's what I gleaned from this. <clears throat> A big working group was formed in the governor's office or working with the governor's office. Legislators went. You know, and you can call it woke or not. Um, if you go farther towards Burlington, woke is not a term that uh, has the meaning that was presented here uh, by the Assistant Majority Leader Bacon. Representative Holtorf. Um, yes. I would like very much for our debate to move forward focused on the legislation in front of us. Sure. I, I would like to get us back to the bill and not earlier commentary. Thank certainly, you. Certainly, Madam Speaker. Appreciate that. Um, she did have a little latitude, so. Um, yes, and maybe. she asked for it, Representative. Okay, Holter. well, I will. I'll not ask you to move back to the bill. Thank, Thank you, you, Madam Speaker. I will not expect the same latitude then at this time, and I will focus on the bill. Um, and I will not mention what woke means in Eastern Colorado at this time. So let's get back to the bill. What came out of this as I drove farther and farther away from the Denver Metroplex is the governor and legislators and others working together are going to take this legislation and superimpose their master plan upon every municipality county and planning and zoning commission let me say it the other way because it starts with the planning and zoning commission which i have the pleasure of serving on in washington county for a term so i understand what that job is and so do others in here that have served on planning and zoning commissions because the municipalities and the counties want to take care of their people and that's actually their job so this bill takes top-down mandates and says you will build these multi-unit buildings in these places. Now remember they listed the places and they're all Denver metro area counties for the most part, from Fort Collins down to Dugco, Castle Rock, I believe. And the, the bill says that if you don't do what we say, you don't get your tax. You're not getting it, because we're not going to give it to you. If you don't do what we say, and I think the magic number was 40 units and an acre. As I drove towards Burlington, Madam Speaker, I started crossing the plains. And I realized as I drove that one size doesn't fit all. For you legislators from District 2 or District 1 or District 3 or District 4 in the concrete jungle, that is your city, what you're saying with this House Bill 1313, Housing and Transit-Oriented Communities, is that you will do this or else. Well, <clears throat> I remember the British did that back in the colonial days. You will do this or else. Yeah, it's a real thing. Study history. But there were the or else's that said, no, we won't do this. We will reject your mandates. We're not doing them. 
You need to understand that the more you try to underwrite the liberties and self-determining destiny that is the foundation of this country, you will get the or else. In some measure, maybe sooner than later. So as you all sit there around your big wooden tables, talking with the governor's staff, writing legislation, you need to really think about what you're doing. Now when I did get to Burlington, Kit Carson County, around the kind of people that I like to hang out with, real salt-of-the-earth people, who believe that their liberties should not be infringed and they should not be told what to do by the state or the federal government, by some dictator or some ruler or some pontiff or some emperor who knows better than everybody else, I thought to myself, it is a shame that we in this chamber are promoting rules, statutes that will become rules that tell everybody how to live. And what they have to do and get in line or get the buggy whip. Now the buggy whip is denying them the taxes that come from their tax base that is their money that they give to the state, but now you're gonna take the people's money that they gave to the state and you're gonna punish them. Now yeah, that is a very strange, weird, obnoxious, confusing, and eccentrically interesting way of promulgating statutes. It almost sounds like woke, but it's not. Representative Holtorf, I've asked you, not again. We yes, have an Madam opportunity Speaker. to engage in respectful debate. I will ask you as a member of this body to continue to speak to the bill and nothing else. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I will tell you that anybody that believes the state should tell every county or municipality what to do, go ahead and vote yes on this bill. Go ahead, vote yes, because that's what you're saying today. That the governor's working group and these legislators that put this marvel of, of, of mandated housing together to force housing units to go where they might have built the rail in the wrong place, They're going to force it, and it'll happen. And you may or may not get this development over time. You already haven't through the free enterprise and the free market system. You haven't got it. Did the cart get before the horse? Well, where I'm from in the country, I'd say yes. So now we're going to force it. And the heavy hand of government yet comes down again from the people that bring this type of legislation to this chamber. Representative Holtorf, you have one minute remaining. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I'm glad. But I'll tell you, the good old boys from eastern Colorado don't like what we see. And the good old boys from eastern Colorado are the ones that will be the first to say, we aren't taking it, and we're not having it, and we're not doing it. And that goes with so many things that we're doing in this chamber. So many of these heavy-handed mandates that infringe upon our civil liberties and our constitutional rights as citizens in a free land. A free land, born of free people, who have rejected once the heaviest hand of government from King George. And they stand ready to reject the heavy hand of government 
from any other person that wants to mimic that type of Representative, your whole t Representative Holtorf, your time's expired. Representative Hartsook. Good morning. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Good morning. So on this beautiful Sunday morning, as we look out to the west, we have these gorgeous mountains. As we look to the east, we watch sunrise. And sitting here in this metro valley, we have the front range communities. And we're up here debating a bill that will A, establish a new form of government for the transit authorities, and B, its stated purpose is to increase density of housing along corridors of transit. So before you all vote today, I would ask you to think about why did you decide to either move to Colorado? What is it you like about Colorado? What is it you don't like about Colorado? And maybe if you've traveled around, compare that to cities like San Francisco, Los Angeles, New York, Boston, Philadelphia, other major big cities. Uh, I've actually lived in several of them. Believe it or not, I was born in LA. Those cities are very, very dense in housing. They're very dense with transit. Same goes for DC. When I was stationed out there, I would ride the Metro in because it's very, very dense. Yet if you look to our west and you look to our east, what do you see? A lot of space. And this bill is focused to increase density so we look like other cities to make it cost effective. And on page 12, it talks about multifamily housing is typically more affordable than single unit dwellings. Kind of common sense. The more stuff you cram into a certain space, the more cost effective it is. But people just like rats don't like to be crammed into space. If you ever see any of the scientific studies, when you start cramming rats into a little tight space, they start fighting. Not much different than what happens around here at times. So then it goes on to say, allowing higher density in residential development is important to this cost effectiveness and availability of affordable housing. Well, I think if we want to talk about affordable housing, that's a whole multitude of things we could start with, construction defects, building permits, et cetera, and that's not the scope of the bill. But that's what it's talking about doing, and there's countless other things that are impacting affordable housing here. It says throughout Colorado, less than half of the available zoning capacity is typically used. Then it goes on to say, Colorado has invested significantly in public transit in the last several decades, funding over, get this figure, $6 billion. Guess how many miles of transit it says we came up with? 85. Just simple math, that's well over $10 million a mile. $10 million a mile for public transit, rail, all of that. Is that what we call cost effective? If we're gonna call cost effective housing, but we're gonna build transit at that cost? That's neither cost effective nor efficient. Not in the business community, certainly not even in the government world. Then it goes on to say that despite these investments, transit ridership lags behind peer agencies around the country due at least in part to a lack of density near these transit lines. Colorado pretty much sits in the middle of the United States. We have the beautiful Rocky Mountains to our west and the plains to our east. People came here for a reason. 150 years ago, they came here for a reason. A lot of them were leaving the east coast. They were leaving the density to come out west. We have a certain ethos here in Colorado. 
for the Western way of life. And that's not just Western in the country, but that's Western like we tend to be independent. We don't want to be like the big coastal cities or the big metropolitan cities, St. Louis, Philadelphia, LA, San Francisco, Seattle, the list goes on and on. We like Colorado. We like our open spaces. We like to be able to get out. And yet we are now going to, as the, we heard this in finance committee, a carrot or a stick. Well, that's a pretty big stick because the stick is not only going to take your highway fund tax. If the counties don't comply, it can do all kinds of other things to them. It's going to force them to develop and build around this housing or this housing around these transit lines. I'm against the government forcing anybody to live anywhere under any circumstances. That's not our job. And I know you've heard me say that a thousand times up here, and I'm going to say it again. The government shouldn't be forcing people where they need to live by taking their tax money and threatening the local governments that your failure to comply, you can't fix your roads. You can't fix your infrastructure because we're going to take your money. The guy literally said in finance, he was okay that if the counties didn't comply, that we took their money. The last time I checked, it's not okay if someone forces you to give up your money, to give up your property, to give up what you have earned. That goes for local governments and those of us that are taxpayers in those local governments. Yet this new transit-oriented communities are going to force counties and municipalities to give up their road and tax money. Why do we like to live the way we do? Because we're different. We like these beautiful mountains to our west, the beautiful skies. We like being out in the open. If we wanted to live in dense housing, you could either move up to Denver or you could move to a different city. You could move to a city that has skyscrapers. You could move to a city that everyone gets crammed in together. I don't think that's what we want. I don't think that's why we live here. I don't think that's our intentions. Yet we're going to say it's cost effective to build these communities. And we talk about the exact numbers that are sitting here in the bill that are talking about 10 million a mile. Again, that is not cost effective. So it says, based on the 2020 census, block housing unit data. Block housing unit data. Is that what we want to build in our transit oriented communities? Block housing? Do we want this to look like everything else? Cinder blocks stacked up and everyone looks the same. There's 65 of us, give or take, in this chamber and we all look differently. We drive different vehicles. Do we want to all live in the same block housing? I don't think so. Let's talk about quality of life. Are we going to cram everybody into because they have no option, unless they want to live way, way out in the suburbs? Are we going to cram them into block housing through the coercion of threatening to take their tax money, threatening them with if they don't comply and take their cars. Representative Hartsook, you have one minute remaining. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. I would urge you before you vote on this bill that you consider your quality of life and the people's quality of life that will be living in these transit oriented communities. Some people might like that. That's fine. Let them have that choice but we should not be using government force to coerce people to live in block housing. I urge a no vote. Thank you. Representative Frizzell.
Good morning, Madam Chair. It's an honor to serve with you. It is an honor to serve with you. Thank you. Members, we've had a lot of conversation around this bill and we're going to have more. What comes to mind when I think about this bill is the, is the phrase, silence is compliance. Because if we don't raise our voices in this chamber against this bill, if we don't, What we are saying is that it is the role of the state to preempt our municipalities. This bill pits this legislature against the cities and towns of Colorado. We ran on Friday a large number of amendments, trying to find some middle ground, trying to ensure that the voices of the municipalities and the citizens that live within them are heard. We ran amendments that would soften the stick, remove the stick, make the density requirements more palatable, make them the purview of the citizens of a municipality, not the state. And exactly zero were accepted. This was not Representative Lisa Frizzell coming up with these amendments, although I did come up with some of them. This is coming from the people. This is coming from the people who represent the cities and towns of Colorado. They are doing their job and making sure that these voices are heard. Because this bill is untenable. It is untenable for municipalities. It is setting them up for failure. It is indeed the heavy hand of the state. You, you heard me on Friday and I mentioned this a couple of times and I'm gonna mention it again because I think it's important. The word shall is in this bill 68 times, 68. There is nothing there is nothing about partnership. It is a mandate. And that is by design. We talked a lot during debate. We talked a lot about the problems around this bill mandating density requirements based on proposed infrastructure as opposed to existing transportation infrastructure. We talked a lot about highway users' tax funds being diverted. And I think that's an important conversation, so I want to I talk about that again. Where do dollars in the highway users' tax fund, HUTF, come from? They come from the taxes you pay when you fill up your tank at the gas station. They come from vehicle registration fees. They come from faster collections, road usage fees, 
and the ever popular retail delivery fees. Everybody loves those, right? That's, that's where HUTF funds come from. So the, they come from our citizens. They're paying into this so that they can have at least a portion of their transportation infrastructure locally paid for. That's what it's for. We talked about the dollars that go to these municipalities, specific municipalities. And it's a lot of money. It's a lot of money. In Colorado Springs alone, it was probably around $20 million just last year. That's a lot of money. This bill takes that money away if the municipality does not comply. If you don't do what we say, you don't get your money, which has, oh, by the way, nothing to do with affordable housing, nothing to do with transit-oriented development. It has nothing to do with that. It has everything to do with keeping the streets and highways of this state safe and, tr and, and so that we can travel. It fills potholes. It builds bridges. It repairs. It has nothing to do with transit-oriented development. It ran several amendments trying to change the housing opportunity goals, just to modify them. 40 units per acre is not always going to be possible. It's not. This bill completely ignores the fact that development standards, they vary. It is not the same throughout the Front Range or the Western Slope. And this bill completely ignores that. Density housing opportunity goals should be determined locally. They should be determined based on infrastructure. They should be determined based on water availability and capacity. And this is nothing more than an unfunded mandate on those municipalities who don't have those things in place in order to accommodate this development. The state should be seeking partnership, partnership not preemption. We should be seeking to be partners with our municipalities and counties in this building. I'd like to read a paragraph from the revised fiscal note because I think it's important. We talked about this on Friday as well, but I wanted to make sure that it wasn't diluted with all the other conversation. Representative Frizzell, you have about a minute left. Thank you. I'll read really quickly then. On page seven, we talk about, in the f revised fiscal note, the diversion of HUTF funding. The bill diverts allocations of HUTF funding from local governments that are non-qualified transit-oriented communities to the transit-oriented communities high highway users tax account. That's one thing. And it says it right there in black and white. The other thing that's really important about this is, up above that, this bill reduces an existing transfer from the general fund. Beginning in fiscal year 24-25, the bill reduces a current law transfer from the general fund to the Housing Development Grant Cash Fund by $35 million. That is money that should be spent statewide on affordable housing projects statewide. It should not be targeted to Denver or Castle Rock. It should be used statewide. Affordable housing is needed statewide. Representative Frizzell, your time has expired.
Please vote no on this bill. Representative Catlin. Thank you, Madam Speaker. It's an honor to serve with you. It is an honor to serve with you. Thank you. I needed to get a drink of that Western Slope water that we slid over to you before I got started. And you know, it's still pretty good, even though it's come over the mountain. Anyway, seriously, folks, I'm down here today to talk to you uh, from a perspective from the Western Slope. This housing is not simply a front range problem. We've all got it. In my districts, in my counties, everyone is talking to me about housing. We're not in the business of transit. We're trying our best to figure out what it's going to take and what it's going to take by you know, conversations with one another and looking to the state as a partner rather than a punishment factor. I, I worry about these kind of bills where we decide we're going we're gonna to incentivize you, but if you don't participate or if you're not doing well enough, we're going to hold back some of the tax money that is dedicated to these kind of improvements. I'm down here today to talk to you about some of the things that happen over on the Western Slope. I have a county that only 3% of that county is privately owned. There is a definite limit on how much ground you can build on. Now, I know that this bill doesn't apply to it, but I've been here long enough to talk about cleanup bills, technical bills, and those kind of things to add on to a framework that was already passed. And this is one of those frameworks. It's concerning. The other thing that's concerning is when a bill calls out a town on the western slope in and around Grand Junction. I'm not sure if you've been to Grand Junction, but if you do go to Grand Junction, you're going to see they are working very, very hard at trying to create housing. They recognize they've got the problem. And they're cooperating with one another in figuring out how they can do it. Because I don't know if you found out or not, but Grand Junction is very attractive to all of the folks that live on the Eastern Slope because of density. But we are working over there at trying to address some of these kind of concepts. You know, it's, it's interesting. The bill is aimed at creating Denser housing while near transit centers faces significant challenge of trying to mold legislation around a transportation system that's outdated and not ready to support the increased density the bill would bring. You know, as just a common, as just an observation, I thought that if you were going to propose a development somewhere, anywhere in the state of Colorado, that you would go through planning, and part of the things that you would look at are the water mains that service that community or that area, and the electrical service, and the sanitation services, sewage, transportation for, for uh, trash and all. But it appears to me that you'd be able to go in and start to build one of these 40 unit per acre developments and maybe not even have considered that. Now, I'm, you know, I'm sure that's not going to happen. But if that does happen, that affects the town that's having that development built. Now it's the community that has to build and rebuild that infrastructure. That's concerning because we're saying, okay, you can do all these things and after it's done, the water pressure goes down for everyone and or it doesn't work in that high, that high rise. 40 units per acre is pretty thick, pretty, you know, pretty dense, I guess is how you'd say it here. 
seems like we would ramp up on these things rather than just immediately jump in. You know, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm not a housing expert, as you can tell. But the method of enforcement unfairly penalizes local governments potentially diverting essential funds away from communities that may already be striving towards these goals independently. I'm in favor of partnerships. I'm in favor of people sitting together and deciding what can the community do, what can the state do, what can the developer do, and what's the demand. Changing behavior is going to take a long time. Convincing people to ride transit is going to take an awful lot of education, more than we've put into it already. You know, I'm fairly new in Denver. But when I look at those trains that go back and forth up and down along I-25, there's not very many people riding them. Maybe I'm just there at the wrong time of day. But I don't see a lot of people in them. I'm not sure why. I think probably a lot of it is people still like their own personal freedom to decide when to go home or when to stay at the restaurant or how those kind of things work and not look at their clock and say, oh, I've got to hurry. My train is going to be there. My train is going to be there. Sounds like any other city in the state, in the United States, rather than Denver. Denver sits here on the edge of the Rocky Mountains with the ability to come and go to all of those places and things and all of the things that we enjoy. We're not ready for all of that yet, in my opinion. The goal of this bill is commendable, but have we taken enough time to talk to the communities that will be impacted and ask them what could the state of Colorado do rather than withhold your, your highway tax? It seems inappropriate to me to try and punish anyone by withholding those transportation dollars. That's from a perspective of someone who is able to live on a place where there's a lot of space, and I can see the mountains, and I can see the stars, and I can see what it's like to live in Colorado. Folks, let's not turn the front range of Colorado into any other city so that if you just woke up one day and didn't know where you were, you couldn't guess. Thank you. Vote no. Representative Luck. Thank you, Madam Speaker. My first vacation uh, was actually to Durango when I was a child, a baby. Uh, we rode on that famous railroad that the representative spoke of from there last week. And we did that multiple times throughout the course of my life. Uh, there was this one couple some seasons in a row who would follow the train up to different spots and they would jump out of their vehicle and they would wave like this in tandem with each other. And it has become a family sort of greeting to wave that way because we understand the derivative of that and it reminds us of some good family time. I greatly appreciate when folks come down here to do the journal and they share aspects of their particular district things that I may know and that harken back to good memories and things that I don't know that I can learn and, and experience or add to my list of, of things to do. Each community, each district has its own character. And out of that character, there are beautiful things and there are struggles. In my district, if I were to ask you, what are the challenges facing Beaver Park water? You may ask, where is Beaver Park water? Similarly, what is Dawson Ranch or Lincoln Park or Rosita looking at? Do you know why some of the communities are up in arms over particular corporations, what corporations those are? 
why they're interfacing with the federal government. Do you know that about my district? Maybe some of you do, maybe some of you don't. But these kinds of policies concern me because there is unique character in every district. And there are unique challenges. Unique challenges that things like this can often overlook. There are also unique beauties. There are times when communities say, you know what, we want to look a particular way. I don't represent El Paso County, but I do know a lot about it, being you know, one of the towns that my folks go to, travel to, to get groceries, big groceries when they go into town. It's Colorado Springs. And there is an awareness that high rises or buildings shouldn't go beyond a certain height. It's a long-standing rule in Colorado Springs that was recently, as I understand it, altered or fought over. Why is that? Because of the beautiful views of Pikes Peak and not wanting to preclude any particular building from being able to see them. Character is important. The colleague who just spoke from Montrose pointed to that, to the importance of being able to look at a picture of a community and identify this is that particular community just by its very design. The bill sponsors read for us last week the list of communities that are going to be impacted by this bill as written currently in the present moment. And none of my communities actually are on that list. That being said, some of them are very close to being added to that list. So while we don't currently have a, a full horse in the race, so to speak, on this particular policy as being impacting my communities over the next two years, I still feel like I need to stand up in support of my people for two reasons. One, as I understand it, much of the funding of this comes out of Tabor refunds, the general fund, diminishing Tabor refunds over the long haul. The Canary Report we received in appropriations contemplates that this will go through 38-39, impacting Tabor refunds through 2038-2039 fiscal year. That's a long time. And my people do receive taper refunds, and that will be diminished by this program. This program that is looking to only impact a handful of communities at present. Is that fair and just? I don't know. I would say not, but I suspect we could have a vivid and robust conversation over it. The other thing that I will speak on behalf of my people is the fact that Colorado does have a character, a beautiful character, one that we would like to preserve. And the idea of forcing municipalities to embrace this particular design type, and I don't mean architectural style that it has to be this right and that left and this color and that pitch, but what I do mean is this type of density of housing. That is a character choice. That is a community choice. And it does alter the flavor and the feel of a community. I would say that those decisions should be left up to the people who are closest to it, who know not only the challenges, but also know what identity they are trying to project on the world. Pueblo is one of my communities and I hear from folks in other parts of the state, oh, that's a dangerous place, or what's good in Pueblo? And I would say it is a diamond in the rough. It is a beautiful city, full of arts, full of creativity. And just down the road where I live is an equestrian town full of innovation. We have some of the most innovative businesses, including Estes Rockets and equine digit support system that creates horseshoes for all over this world. Each one of my communities has its own unique identity, its own unique name, so to speak, right? Not just a name, but identity, feeling, sense. I would hope the same for all of your communities, that you could say that, and that you wouldn't want just 
one place to look exactly like the next, exactly like the next, exactly like the next. And so I would encourage you to vote no on this bill, not because affordable housing isn't an important conversation, but because the people who are governing your cities and your counties know that. They know that their people are struggling. They have these conversations day in and day out with the actual people constantly in that predicament. As the assistant minority leader often says, in the grocery store. Let them be the determiner for how to solve this problem in their way, in their unique culture, with their unique challenges, with their funding and partners. Unleash the innovation there and be part of that conversation. But don't force them to adopt this. Don't force them to embrace one way. Freedom has served us well up to this point. Representative Marvin. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Colorado is in a housing crisis. We all know this. It's too expensive for regular people. Adults can't afford rent. Families can't afford to buy a home. Seniors are getting pushed out. And I'm so grateful to everyone in this chamber who's been working on this problem. And I also want to thank the sponsors for how hard they've been working on this bill in particular and all the stakeholding that's been done. There are a lot of really great things in this bill that I like. I really believe in housing goals, and I also appreciate that this provides the flexibility for how municipalities meet those goals and has also identified sources of funding. However, I've heard from my city council that they have many concerns about taking away the HUTF funds um, and are worried that it would result in major losses for the city and make our roads unsafe for years to come. Amendments were offered yesterday, and I'm sorry they didn't pass, because if they had, we could have removed a huge barrier for our municipalities to support this. Addressing our housing crisis is important, but I feel like this bill does need some work. I'm going to be a yes vote on this today, but as it moves to the Senate, I expect these conversations to happen to address the very legitimate concerns that city councils like mine have, and I hope it can be worked out and come back to this chamber, um, and I will be a yes vote today. Representative Snyder. Thank you, Madam Speaker. <clears throat> well, this has uh, been a, quite a journey. Um, this bill we heard in finance, and uh, I was encouraged, I was reluctant, but I voted it through to the floor, and here we are on third reading, and the offensive parts of the bill are still in there. It, puts, it makes it really a difficult decision for me, because I support transit-oriented development, in this case, transit-oriented communities, We've got a historic opportunity to bring down federal funds to really put in, a, for the first time in my time here in Colorado, a chance to put in a light front range passenger rail. I think that could be transformed. I've seen transit oriented development work in many cities, including DC where I grew up. We used to ride the subway every day. We have mayors across the state, as divergent as Mayor Kaufman in Aurora, and Mayor Mobadable down in Colorado Springs, where I'm from, who support transit-oriented communities. I think there's a lot of meat on that bone, and I think it could be transformative for Colorado, because as we move into the future, we can't just keep sprawling out. Colorado Springs is so sprawled, they are geographically the size of the city of Los Angeles, with 1 14th the population to support all the stormwater, roads, bridges, everything else. We have to start moving away to a different process. But I am still so offended by this threat of holding hut tough money that it makes it really hard for me to get to a yes on this bill. So just by way of review, what is funded? How is the hut tough funded? Well, you can start with the 22 cents per gallon gas tax, age and waste age and weight-based vehicle registration fees, plug-in electric motor vehicle registration fee, electric vehicle road usage equalization fee. Out of the faster revenue, we have the road safety surcharge, late registration fees, daily vehicle rental fee, oversized overweight vehicle surcharge, road usage fee, 
retail delivery fees. Miscellaneous, we have traffic penalties, judicial collections, interest earnings, and various cash program revenues. Basically, everybody in Colorado, every adult pays into the Hut Tough funds. And now we're gonna tell them, oh, great, but well, we're not gonna send that money back to your local jurisdictions. We're gonna withhold it because we want to strong arm you into believing in this. I can't, I can't understand with so many people pull in support of the good parts of this bill, how come we still have to have this big sword of Damocles hanging over everybody's head? It is, it is beyond offensive. It makes me think whether it's an intention or not, and I don't want to speak to anybody's intentions, but there's a retributive nature to this bill. It's almost like it, it, after 213 failed last year. So, Representative Snyder, back to the current bill, please. So I, there's too much good in this bill for me to just vote it down today. It kills me. I'm, I guess I'm going to hold my nose and hope and have a look, what faith I have left that it'll go over to the Senate. I think there will be Senate amendments, but by God, if this comes back with these same provisions in it, not only will I vote against it, I will use every ounce of energy I have to defeat this bill. These are so offensive and the wrong thing for people in Colorado disrespects local governments and their autonomy. You don't know how much they, they plan on this money. I served in local government for close to 20 years in one capacity or another. These monies are programmed out 10, 15 years. They pull down matching funds. For Colorado Springs, they were looking at over the next 10 years, $200 million that they'd have to sh make up if, this, if these hot, tough threats were to come to pass. So I'm not proud to say this, but I will be voting this through today. But by God, if it, if it doesn't get fixed, I don't know what I'm going to do, but I'm not going to be a happy legislator. Thank you. Representative Taggart. Thank you, Madam Speaker. It's an honor to serve with you. An honor to serve with you. When I first this, read this bill, I was scared to death. And I came to this well and spoke on behalf of my community that our transit areas have been completely built out. And I was later told after I spoke that my community, Grand Junction, that I love so much was not a part of this. I found that interesting given the fact that here's a bill from a transit standpoint and it isn't identified any place in the bill that the expenditures for this bill are front range only. And not the entire front range, but rather a portion of the front range. Yet guess what? The people of Western Colorado end up paying for it. The people of Western Colorado end up losing Tabor refunds over it. In the second year of this bill, that's $50 million. And that $50 million gets bigger and bigger and then comes back down a little bit over a period of 15 years to the degree of a half a billion dollars almost. And again, the people of Western Colorado pay for that, but get nothing out of that. Now I understand we have to support a state as a whole and the needs of the, of the state as a whole. But I would like to see some bills from time to time that are focused on the needs of Western Colorado and rural Colorado. And quite honestly, I don't see those. I'm worried about this bill for the folks of, front, of the front range. These tough funds being taken away, carrying a big stick. That's not the way we should be doing business. 
I heard the word empower as it related to this bill, that we are empowering local government. I have never heard that word used when there's a penal, significant penal part of this bill. I've never empowered anybody from a business standpoint and then turned around and slapped them on the head. That's not how you do business. That's not how government should work. So my problem with this bill is, A, is strictly front range. And I know there may be some folks that probably haven't spent much time in Western Colorado. But we have needs too. So I have a problem in that respect because you're asking us to pay for this. But equally as so, we are approaching local government not with empowerment, but punitive measures. I can't vote for a bill that does that. Thank you. Representative Titone. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, I don't, don't come down here too often on third reading, uh, especially to oppose uh, one of my colleagues' bills, but um, I represent two cities that need the HUTF money. They need that money. And in particular, uh, the parameters of this bill for the city of Golden, and I don't know if you've ever been to the city of Golden. Uh, if you haven't, please visit, it's very beautiful. It's, it's a mountain town, but it's not in the mountains. But it's a mountain town. I mean, you, you see the, the, the similarities of small mountain towns in Golden, but here it is in the Front Range. They don't have the space to put the housing that's required in this bill. They have topography challenges. They have a government center at the end of the train station. And they're not sure with the parameters of this bill if the RTD shuttle from the train station to the School of Mines is in that radius of influence of where they have to build. And if that's the case, the whole entire downtown area could be in that. And if you build density in the little downtown area of Golden, you're gonna ruin the charm of Golden. You can't do that. I won't, I won't have that happen. So I'm advocating for my two cities today. Uh, I do believe in transit-oriented construction of, of homes. I, I think we need to do this. It's, it's the right thing to do. And there are a lot of good things in this bill that we need to put in place. But the cities that I represent, it's not gonna work for them. So I'm asking if this bill does get to the Senate, that something gets worked out for Golden to be able to, I don't know, I mean, small mountain towns have been exempt from the bill. Golden's not in the mountains, but if there's a way to do that, that would definitely help them. And the HUTF money has to go around to everybody. We can't just leave it to the people who are doing this and, and have plans to do it anyway and are doing it, and then to be denied that because we're not doing it in the way that is mandated by this bill. It's just too restrictive. And for those reasons, I'm gonna be a no on this bill today. Uh, I do thank the sponsors for all their work. I know they've been working really hard on this, but it's just, my cities just can't handle this, so thank you. Representative Bradley. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I too come down here to fight for my county. I love how we talk about local control when it's good for us, when it supports our bills. And then when it doesn't, we regulate against it. This bill regulates against local control. We should not force local communities to be regulated. That is not our role as the 65 of us sit in here. Density goals should be determined locally based on water availability, infrastructure. This is not a one, I hate when we legislate in a one size fits all model. That is not responsible governance. 
You are tying the hands of our local government to determine how to solve this problem. I have mayors in my district, in Lone Tree, in Castle Pines, in Castle Rock. We have city council members, we have awesome county commissioners that are trying to find reasonable solutions to this without us standing up here and saying, this is how it's gonna be done. That's offensive to them. They want affordable housing in our districts, but just throwing a bill down and telling everyone to follow it is not the way that we should be doing government. This is gonna have a huge impact on the I-25 corridor in Douglas County. We don't want this. We don't have the infrastructure to do this. And we talk, you know, the head of the Colorado Municipal League said it best to me. This proposal might actually generate more outrage from local officials than 213, and I agree, I think it has. The only difference is that got shoved down our throats the last day of session. Many cities, including Denver, promote denser housing near transit already, so go live there. Don't make my county do this. Go live in Boulder, go live in Denver. If you want to live by transit, then go live in one of those cities. But you don't get to muddy up my county because you believe this one size fits all is what we should do. That is horrible governance. He also argues that the state could achieve its goal by partnering, whoa, what a concept, with local governments to address their housing needs rather than punishing those who don't follow the state's lead. We're going to punish the counties that don't follow this. It's inappropriate to try to punish anyone by withholding those highway dollars. And we have heard representative after representative, Democrat and Republican, come to this well and preach that. And I'm just going to finish with an email that someone sent all of us, because I don't know if you read it. And I thought it was such a great summary of this bill. To the attention of Colorado House representatives, please vote no on HB 2413. This is an extreme one-size-fits-all state density mandate. Similar to last year's failed SB 23213 bill, this bill usurps all local land use planning and control from local city planning departments. Local officials best know their widely varying unique land use situations. Those people were voted in to protect our local control. The same constituents that put us here elected them. Colorado is a state county partnership. Each county has fully developed land use plans, health and human service departments, housing authorities, and this takes away local control to address local issues in a way that will lead to success. HB 241313 should be voted down just like last year's bill. Mandates that increase housing units to 15 to 40 housing units per acre is extreme. That's a three times to 10 times increase over existing density. We're not going a one fold increase, we're going a 10 fold increase. Horrible governance. Our existing infrastructures are not built for this density. We all saw what happened with Excel last weekend. They can't even handle adequate oversight of current demand. Cities don't have anywhere near the infrastructure needed to support this much density increase this fast. Again, we're going from a one-fold increase to let's go tenfold. We have water and sewer capacity issues, roads and bridges. I mean, we all drive in here. Our roads are a mess. Overly clogged highways, underfunded and overstretched city and county departments such as fire, police, sheriffs, parks, recreation center, and libraries. And I ran an amendment for an evacuation model. We see what happened in Paradise. We, had, we saw what happened in the Marshall Fire. But the goal is just to build and build and build and not give anyone the opportunity to get out when a fire happens, because it will happen. Poor legislation. Our existing parks and rec centers are aging. In my neighborhood and city, we have failing 60-year-old sewer and water systems, potholed roads, traffic jams, parking issues, and all the other issues that come from too much density. HB 241313's one-size-fits-all approach is far too extreme and lacking in sensitivity 
to cities' unique situations and challenges. And lastly, the bill's punitive withholding of state transportation funds that we pay into. For non-compliant cities, it's completely unacceptable. Those funds are used by cities for road maintenance, safety, and stormwater drainage. We have all paid our state taxes, and it is dirty politics to blackmail cities and counties like mine into compliance through heavy-handed punishments. This is not good governance. And for the people who came up here and said that we hope the Senate will amend this, stand for your constituents. Stand for your communities. Stand in this house and say, absolutely no. My constituents have spoken. They have put you in office to protect them. Representative Bradley, I'll just urge you, caution here. Don't want to be accusing members of uh, taking action, criticizing their comments in a way that are disrespectful. Please proceed. Thank you. We were placed, we were elected just like our mayors and our city councils were elected by the people. We come up here to represent the people and the people have spoken. This is not a one size fits all. My district is different from your district and your district and your district. And this bill is going to mandate that we all jump into a one size fits all. That is horrific governance and I urge you, in the name of your constituents that put you here, to vote no on it. Representative Bradfield. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, I have no less passion against this bill than Representative Bradley just spoke. Um, I haven't got received a single email from El Paso County that was in support of this bill. And there are many, many emails. This isn't good legislation. Those of you who feel that it is may not be in contact with the people in your communities. Think about that. What does your email stream say? Wonderful. S vote yes. I didn't get a single one of those. I will be a no. I hope you will too. Representative Clifford. I was still feverishly typing away over here at what I want to say, Madam Chair. It's an honor to serve with you. An honor to serve with you. First, I have to again thank the sponsors for their grace in engaging me in this process. I have um, never uh, wavered in what I thought about this bill and they have been extraordinary in meeting with me and meeting with my community and looking at land use issues and uh, making sure that I had access to the governor's team to look at everything. I have seven transit oriented communities in my community in House District 37 and um, I've heard what a lot of people have said about their issues with this bill and while I share some of those they're not they're not my biggies. The biggie for me is that this bill takes $35 million out of the housing development grant funds. It takes $35 million worth of affordable housing money and moves it to projects that do not address affordability or require affordable housing. In House District 37, housing demand is already greater than any amount of housing that I could put on any available land, anything that we could feasibly build. This bill is just about density. In my district, there hasn't been a resistance to that density. The cities in my district approve these types of housing projects already, but they also take into account countless local issues that this bill widely ignores. I hear about comments about communities should take their fair share. My communities have worked collectively 
to address that the neighboring cities would be able to address this as a region. There's even a ballot issue out in Greenwood Village right now to de-annex the northern part of their city so that Aurora can annex it because Aurora can better serve the housing with their city services in that particular area. Greenwood Village currently has more multifamily housing units in their city than any other city in the state other than Glendale, which has all apartments in one house. They've done their fair share. We can talk about their methods, what this bill does. We can debate all day long why we are not able to build um, condominiums in this state, but this bill, if we followed it to the letter of the law, we would put very expensive apartments right next to our very expensive houses in my community. Not, no, no, no address for a middle, no address for affordable ownership, just density. In Greenwood Village, in our eight square miles in that city, there are pro approximately 6,800 housing unit, units currently, citywide. If we took the calculations of this bill, we would easily add 12,000 plus additional housing units. We would triple the size of their city on the existing city services without addressing water issues effectively, without addressing traffic issues effectively, without really taking into many of the local concerns. Uh, anybody that's ever been at Bellevue or Orchard Station or anybody in my community that has to get their kids to middle school, where we have Bellevue or Orchard that runs up against I-25 can tell you that you are in for a 30 minute wait today to be able to use those roads to get to our schools. Even if 80 or 90% of the people that moved into this new housing in my community used public transit, the 10% left still would break our traffic. It just doesn't reconcile. None of my communities received 123 funds. Right now, we at least have the eligibility of this affordable housing money. In the seven transit-oriented communities that we have in my district, this just doesn't work. It doesn't math. We've got $30 million in here for water infrastructure. One project, one project at one TOC designation in my district to go from a 12-inch water line to a 24-inch water line, that single project alone is more than $30 million. So we're going to have we're, we're going to take affordable housing money and put it into a program that's supposed to support these types of communities in 38, 39 different cities and make that money work across those different cities? I got one project that can take it all, 100% of it. Right now, I have access to affordable housing money. I want to keep affordable housing money. You know, if we were talking about in the transit-oriented communities, if you were talking about taking $35 million, possibly even out of the affordable housing funds, and putting it into transit to have our transit really work, and then you were going to organically grow communities around transit that worked, I would likely be thinking that that was the greatest thing since sliced bread. I just don't have a way to get to a yes. Even if we don't deal with the HUTF funds, even if we don't address, you know, 38 different communities that have said we must address these different amendments. You got to get these amendments to get us to a yes. We haven't accepted any of them. The bill widely remains exactly the way that it's been the whole time that I've been engaged with it. The entire wall of my office is covered with TOCs. I can't make this work. I'm a math guy. I can't make it work. I can't make it work. I can't make it work. I am a no, and on behalf of House District 37, I request everyone else vote no. Thank you. Representative Wilford. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Colleagues, I've really appreciated the robust and thoughtful conversation that we've had about this bill. I think it's really showcased the variety of different issues that we face when it comes to solving the affordable housing crisis that we have across our state. I've heard a lot of, um, from you about what you hear in your community, and so I'm gonna take a minute and tell you what I hear from mine. 
in almost every single town hall meeting I have, on almost every single door I knock on, I hear that the cost of living and affordable housing are the biggest issues in my district. I've talked to seniors who have come into the community because Northland is only 52 years old, that built their home, put their stake in the ground in this community and wanna stay in it, but don't have affordable options to be able to downsize or do so. Instead, they're having to look at leaving their safety net, their community, in order to move out of state, um, to find something that's more affordable, to find another housing option where they're not having to drive um, miles upon miles and they have access to public transit. And I think that's a real travesty, especially when you've built your community in that neighborhood, especially when you've raised your kids in those neighborhoods neighborhoods. And I, for one, am very invested in identifying ways in which we can solve this problem. So you all know the city that I represent is a seven and a half square mile city. And when you're that geographically small, you rely on the region to be a partner with you because we're only as strong as we are together. And that means that when you have one community that is carrying the water for all of those in the region, it means that those partners that are supposed to exist in neighboring communities aren't carrying their load. And so you think about, I think about a community north of me that said, we don't want to do any more affordable housing. We don't want to see any more density. We don't want to approve projects because we just don't like them. That means that everybody else is having to deal with the impacts of the rising cost of living and the lack of development that's happening. And frankly, that's not fair. We need everybody to be engaged and involved in a solution to address this problem. Transit is also one of the bigger issues that I hear about. And those of you who have been in local government, I know that's a very small number of people in this chamber, know that when we talk about transit, there's often the issue of the last mile. How do you get people home after they've gotten off of a bus, after they've gotten off of a train or a light rail? How do you get them home that last mile? Are they walking? Are they taking a lift or a taxi? Are they taking a scooter? Is somebody else picking them up? How are they getting home? Bills like this help solve that problem, especially when you have housing within half a mile or within a fourth of a mile from transit. I heard a representative talk about how her community has old rec centers that are falling apart, roads that are falling apart, sewers that are dilapidated, and I would say to that, I would say to that issue, that is, not, that is not an issue for the state to solve. That is a result of poor city planning, poor county planning. The cost of sprawl is also a cost to taxpayers. When you think about sprawl, we're talking about the response time for first responders. We're talking about more city services, more infrastructure like roads and sewers to maintain. So let's not pretend like the sky is falling here. This bill offers reasonable, targeted, and flexible options for local governments that will improve affordability and will improve our air quality in summer months. Cities only qualify if they are in a metropolitan planning organization and have a population of more than 4,000 people and more than four or 75 acres of transit areas. 30 jurisdictions banding together to solve the affordability issue. As far as the HUTF piece, I too, I don't, I don't love that piece. I'll be perfectly honest. My community uses that money to be able to regularly plan for how we're going to improve our city's PSI. 
Um, that's our, <laughs> it's our pavement um, or our, our road conditions. Um, we always prioritize the roads that are in the worst disrepair first. Um, but we rely on that money to be able to plan and uh, move forward projects that are important to our community. And so I, I don't love that piece. And frankly, I was a little surprised on Friday that after all of the amendments that the one that would have simply excluded that funding did not come forward again. Um, but this is our process, members. We introduce bills. We have many conversations throughout the committees, throughout this floor process. We send our bills to the next chamber and they do the same thing and then those bills come back to us. And so for any of us to think that we're going to send this bill to the Senate and there will be zero amendments, I think is just a little... I don't want to say naive, but I, I, I do think it's a little naive because not seeing one in, not one bill that we introduce is passed word for word by the time it gets to the governor's desk. So there is much work ahead of us, and I, for one, am not willing to throw the baby out with the bathwater over HUTF funding because I think that there's still a fix available for that. And we owe it to our communities and our constituents to answer the call to them um, when they tell us that they have an issue with affordable housing and transit options. So I will be a yes today and look forward to the bill coming back from the Senate so we can continue the conversation about how we solve this problem for Colorado. Thank you very much. Representative Bradley, this is your second time speaking and you have two minutes and 41 seconds remaining. Great, I won't take that much time, thank you. Um, this was an email that was sent to all of us just to be come up and for clarity. I just wanted to make sure you guys got to listen to the email sent to me. It was not about my district. It was not about the rec centers in my district. And to say poor city planning, things get outdated. Infrastructure gets bad and worn down. I think that that's a, you know, a, a direct assault on the people in our local communities that are fighting for infrastructure and against high density. Um, and if this was not a mandated bill, great. North Glen, have at it. Boulder, have at it. Denver, have at it. Create your high density areas. But this is going to withhold funding from districts like mine if we don't comply. Let's be honest and call a spade a spade. We are going to withhold funding if districts don't jump right in. So if you want it in your district and your community has said, we don't want to walk very far, then go for it. My community is not saying that and to regulate all of our communities into submission is wrong. Assistant Minority Leader Winter. Good morning, Madam Speaker. Good morning. Good morning, colleagues. For me to get up here and talk about high density housing wouldn't be serving my district very well because as you know in my district there's not very much high density housing. And that's a beautiful thing about my district. But the issue I take is with the money, the $35 million. This fund is a statewide fund and this will redirect dollars out of House District 47 and push them to transit oriented communities alongside the Front Range in the metroplexes. It's just not good for House District 47. And the problem is, is my counties and communities see this over and over again. They see money pulled out of their district. They see unfunded mandates. And we're fighting to survive in rural Colorado. We're fighting to survive. We are fighting to save our communities. And by pulling more dollars for them based off something they couldn't even do in the first place. I mean, we need affordable housing everywhere as well as in House District 47. And we've seen it over and over again. We're going to see it with this bill. I'm going to bring up a bill from last year, you know, the uh, tax credits for electric vehicles. We don't even have the infrastructure for our constituents to even put in for that tax credit. So that is money that could have been used within my district that once again was pulled to the metro area where you have the infrastructure to do this. And I've heard it be brushed upon last year, not this year, that, you know, what do you as rural Coloradans provide for what you get back? Well, I'll tell you this much. The people in House District 47, they know their worth. We sit up here and talk about severance tax all the time. It funds DNR. JBC sweeps it to fill gaps. Well, guess what? That comes from energy production in House District 47. 
small business and working class families prop up not only this economy, but the nation's economy. And guess what? In House District 47, we're small business and middle class. One of the counties I represent, Pueblo, we've had people at the steel mill producing steel, producing income and jobs, helping build the world. And those people in House District 47, there's some of them that work at that mill, and that money comes from House District 47. What about food and fiber? Rural Colorado produces food and fiber, and guess where that comes from? That comes from House District 47. That matters. So to pull more and more dollars from these communities, in a way it's egregious and wrong. It's like we're being forgotten, like we're the stepchildren. You know, in Los Animas County, we mined the coal that built the steel that built this state. And I'm proud of that. And the farmers and ranchers turn the soil that feeds you all. And I'm proud of that. And guess what? I'll beat on it again. And guess what? We pull the gas out of the ground that keeps you warm in the winter. And I'm proud of that. What makes Colorado, we talk about a Colorado for all, and I talk about that all the time up here. What makes a Colorado for all? I said this the other day in the gun debate. It's almost like we live in two different states now, and that's a damn shame. I'm going to push you in the corner. You're going to push me in the corner. And there was a representative that got up here and said, we would do more if we actually worked together. And we're not discounting the issues that you face in your area, but you can't govern the whole state like you govern the Metroplex. It does not work. Round peg, square hole, apples and oranges. We could talk about it all the time. And I think that what falls on deaf ears from this side of the chamber is, is you do what you do. You do what you have to do as long as it don't affect us. We're just asking for that little bit of dividing line. One of the good representatives from the other side of the aisle, I agree, you should throw everything you have at it, but not at the expense of my district. Not at the expense of House District 47. Do you. Let us do us. Can we not see that that is divide in this chamber? And we're not asking you to do us. That's the crazy thing about this. I'm tired of being put in the corner. And the representative from Grand Junction said something very important. You know, we talked about it during special session. Or, uh, special session. Bipartisanship is just not putting Republicans on Democrat bills and feeding us a little bit. Bipartisanship is being uncomfortable, stepping out of your comfort zone and getting on our bills that represent our communities and our people and the issues that they face. One day the pendulum will swing. And I want to be able to be a representative when I go home and say, hey, I get things done. I was on a bill with a good representative from the other side of this chamber, and we got something done for the people of Colorado, and I thank you for that. Help us. Help us represent our constituents. Quit putting us in the corner. Do you. We're not asking you to do us. Thank you. Representative Linstead. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I don't come down to the well uh, very often <laughs> on bills, um, but I did want to come down today and thank the sponsors for working the way they have on this piece of legislation. I know my community has embarked on a conversation about housing over the last few years, and that conversation has uh, sometimes been been, been red hot, sometimes it's been a little bit more understanding. And I think the work the sponsors did this year uh, helped get us to that place. We've been having a conversation about the cost of housing and how we lower the cost of housing. And I think most people in this state understand that it makes sense to build housing near transit, near places where we have investment uh, for buses, for light rail, for whatever it is to get people where they need to go. I, it's not controversial to me. And this piece of legislation 
having been in local government, having make, made land use decisions, makes sense. We should be incentivizing that development. And no, I don't love all the metrics, metrics in this bill. I don't love all the sticks. But at the end of the day, we have a piece of legislation that's actually gonna move the needle. It's actually gonna lower the cost of housing and it's gonna help us reach our critical greenhouse gas reduction goals. So I just will close by thanking the sponsors for their work. I trust you to continue working on this in the Senate so that we can actually make a dis difference in the cost of housing. I was so disappointed last year when we didn't pass uh, and fulfill that mandate that I think our voters sent us uh, here to do, which was to lower the cost of housing. So thank you for your work. Uh, this is really, really critical that we get right. And I, I think um, the, the work the sponsors have done to find those compromises with local governments and will continue to do uh, will finally land us in a place where we can lower the cost of housing. So thank you. Minority Leader Puglisi. Thank you, Madam Speaker Pro Tem. What are you right now? <laughs> yes? Okay. Um, thank you, Madam Speaker Pro Tem. Just want to make sure I got it right. Um, I, I actually want to start where the good representative from Broomfield um, just ended. I do want to thank the sponsors of this bill um, for their engagement with me personally. Um, in May, um, one of the sponsors, the good representative from Denver, reached out to me and said, hey, will you help me talk through implementation? And I have said it at the mic before, and I will always leave this door open for any of you. I may not like where you're trying to go, but I am more than happy to talk and use my life experiences to help you get there better. And I appreciated that he did that to me, um, for me that he said, you know, your land use experience is not just a local government official, but also um, as a land use attorney is important to me and I wanna hear what you think. Um, and I really appreciated that. And I will say, um, probably for one of the first times in my now almost two years being here, I felt valued that my experience was valued. And so for what it's worth, I wanna say thank you for that. Um, there's definitely some things in this bill that um, my experiences, I believe, helped influence, and I appreciate that. Um, the land use bill last year was a one-size-fits-all. Um, this one does exempt a lot of Colorado because our um, state is so different. Um, I still don't agree with the inclusion of Grand Junction, um, mostly because of the federal land issue, and um, there are different issues within our communities that I think still need to be addressed. Um, I do, before I talk about the things that cause me pause, um, I do wanna say, I actually, I don't mind transit-oriented communities in general. I grew up outside of New York City. I lived in walking distance from the train. Um, I didn't have a car until I was 16. Sometimes you gotta get places. My parents worked all the time, and so I, I have not offended by transit-oriented communities if they're done right. Um, I also went to college outside of Philadelphia, and but for Amtrak, I would have never made it home to see my family because they worked so much, they could never pick me up from school. It was like a two hour, two and a half hours, two hours if I drove, two and a half hours if they drove um, trip. So I, I'm grateful for those experiences and, um, and looking at different options. There's a reason I don't live in New York City or Philadelphia, and there's a reason I chose personally to live in Colorado, um, and that's because of the vastness and uniqueness of this state, and I don't wanna see that changed. I want and trust local governments to be able to make those decisions, and I wanna make sure we do it in an important way. And so I respect our local governments and the work that they do, and just remind uh, mostly the governor in this perspective that um, local governments are elected too, and um, that we should respect the autonomy that they bring to their communities. Um, so the two places that I have most issue with, um, I talked a lot about carrots to the governor, not sticks, because that's what prior legislation was looking at. I think there's a way that we can attain um, affordable housing and have those conversations in a very constructive and bipartisan way. 
um, that does not include taking away HUTF funds. Um, those funds are used for public safety, for transportation, for infrastructure, for business development. I mean, you're not going to get businesses to come to some parts of this state unless your transportation and infrastructure is there. And so that's a real important part of this conversation because when one of us um, succeeds, we all succeed in this state. And I feel like that's getting a little bit lost in the conversation. Um, the other thing that I take issue with is um, the WUI. Um, the good representative from El Paso brought an amendment that I supported in a very bipartisan way um, because I thought it was important that we have that conversation about wildfire management and the effects that it has on, on development and the decisions that local governments make in order to make sure those communities are safe. And um, that amendment was not taken and I'm still at a loss. And I'm gonna end on, I think that these conversations are healthy and good and um, will continue to be in, involved to the extent that um, I'm invited to the table and I do appreciate that invitation. I will say I'm getting a little tired of hearing, um, and I hear this probably almost as much as anybody in this room, um, don't worry rep, we're gonna fix this in the Senate. When do we start fixing things in the House? And um, I would really enjoy having conversations about fixing things in the House before they go to the Senate. And then maybe we wouldn't have so many amendments that come from the Senate our way to make bills better. Um, maybe we can make bills better. And I think we have a real opportunity there here today to do that. And so with that, unfortunately, I'm a no vote. But I really do... Um, I felt valued in this conversation, regardless of, you know, I can't get to where this bill ultimately ended up. But I did feel valued, and for that I'm grateful. So thank you. Seeing no further discussion, the motion before us is the adoption of House Bill 1313 on third reading final passage. Mr. Schiebel, please open the machine and members proceed to vote. Speaker pro tem degree Kennedy, how do you vote? Yes. Kennedy votes yes. Representative Velasco, how do you vote? Yes. Representative Velasco votes yes. Representative Ortiz, how do you vote? Yes. Representative Ortiz votes yes. Representative Evans, how do you vote? No. Representative Evans, could you speak again? Representative Evans symbols a no vote with a thumbs down. Representative Soper, how do you vote? No. Representative Soper votes no. Representative Lynch, how do you vote? No. Representative Lynch votes no. Representative Herod, how do you vote? Yes. Representative Herod votes yes. Please close the machine. With 37 aye, 24 no, and 4 excused, House Bill 1313 is adopted. Co-sponsors. Speaker pro tem degree Kennedy, co-sponsors. Representative Herod, co-sponsors. Please close the machine. Madam Majority Leader, before we proceed to the next bill, we have had a fairly long morning already. We're gonna take a five minute recess for individuals to stretch their legs. Please be back on time. 1210 is when we will gavel back in. The end in recess.
The House will come back to order. Members, I will invite you to take your seats. Thank you all. Members, as we begin our debate, I do want to call our attention back to our commitment to engage in civil and respectful debate. I want to highlight uh, a call to focus on the policy in front of us, not to characterize one another's comments or interpret those or rephrase those, but to speak to the policy in front of us. Even as we respond to one another, let's do so as we look at this policy, avoiding characterizations of one another or of groups or of organizations. It is important as we engage in this debate that we model for each other, for our constituents, for our state, the value of respect and civility in public discourse. I thank you all. Mr. Schiebel, please read the title to House Bill 1292. House Bill 1292 by Representatives Hernandez and Epps, also Senator Gonzalez, concerning prohibitions on certain firearms used in public mass shootings. Madam Majority Leader. Madam Speaker. I move House Bill 1292 on third reading and final passage. Representative Armagost. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Well, here we are. Um, this has gotten a lot further than I, or anyone, I think, had expected it to go. Um, we're debating a bill that in the title and in the language of the title prohibits certain weapons used in mass shootings otherwise has been referred to as assault weapons ban uh, or assault weapons ban 2.0 however you want to look at it this is an extension of what we saw last session last session this bill was killed in committee after a strike below essentially was killed went back to the bill and the bill was killed um, this goes way further. Um, not, it, doesn't, it doesn't close in anymore on the actual topics or the actual purpose that is identified by the sponsors in preventing gun violence or preventing mass murders, mass shootings, things like that. I will get to some points that are on statistics done by the FBI. I will get on some points that are essentially negating the fact that there's any level of prevention this bill is going to, to, to produce. I think the biggest thing that this bill produces is an overwhelming uh, burden, an overwhelming restriction on law-abiding gun owners. And it's not just the owners. I understand this isn't about what you already own, but this is about what gun owners are able to purchase. This is simply saying, me as a gun owner, or me as somebody who needs a gun, whether it be a victim, stalking victim, domestic violence, uh, rape, anything, somebody is traumatized or is threatened of any of those things, is unable to go and get a firearm to protect themselves. Why? Because this covers 80% of modern firearms. This is not something that can easily say that, oh, these weapons here specifically are the only ones that are a risk that law-abiding gun owners or hunters or sportsmen 
aren't able to get. Uh, it, it, it collapses that market for anyone that does any of those things. Me as a hunter, it's disheartening for me. <laughs> uh, my dad, who I grew up hunting with, uh, he's well into stage four prostate cancer. He has been surviving that for 16 years now when the life expectancy of that is five years. He's been a trooper. The one thing, he's had to give up construction, which was his lifelong uh, career uh, because of the weakness, because of his bruising and everything else that happens. The other part of that is hunting. That is the, the one true thing that he was able to do every hunting season was get out and hunt. We do that together uh, since childhood, since my childhood. And he hasn't been able to do that because the firearms that he has for hunting, especially when it comes to high powered rifles or shotguns, would bruise him so substantially that he wasn't able to do it anymore. Uh, the, the result was much less uh, enjoyable than the, uh, the harvest that we'd get on any hunt. So we had to modify. He got a semi-automatic shotgun and we're looking, we're in the process right now of suppressing that and putting something on it so he can grip it better and not lose his grip on it. So it would either be a thumb hole stock or a pistol grip. All of those things would make his shotgun an assault weapon and banned under this bill. For somebody that that's the only thing that they can use is something modified to that degree to be able to use it for hunting, to be able to use it as something that won't beat him up so badly that it makes the, the hunt that much just way too unenjoyable to, to even fulfill. So there's, that's what we're doing, not only to people like that that are struggling with medical issues, but people that have disabilities. Um, when you can't buy a modified uh, firearm or you can't mod buy modifications for a firearm because it turns it into this outlandish assault weapon, we are, we are doing harm. And this is that bill that does more harm than good. I always hear that if it saves one life. <laughs> when we're willing to sacrifice everything for everyone to be able to protect themselves, the amount of lives it will cost for somebody to, just in their mind, be able to say, I saved a life, but cost all of these other lives. I don't like that. I think that's dangerous. I think that's, that's inappropriate in what we're doing and making laws for our state and for our citizens. When we're making laws like this, we aren't making laws that, that benefit. We are making laws that restrict, and we aren't restricting the right people. I think one of the, the key important things on this is when we're talking about what firearms are that are classified as assault weapons. Uh, I got the information from the FBI on that, on something that we were able to find in their study. Based on 2020, uh, murders that happened in Colorado in 2020, and we're talking, this would include mass murders, mass shootings, but total murders in Colorado the year of 2020 on the FBI, FBI's statistics, 293. Total of those that were firearms were 202. Of those firearm-related uh, murders, 141 of those, out of those 202, 141 of them were, were done with handguns. Eight of them, eight, single digit, eight of them were with rifles. One of them was with a shotgun. We have 40 by knives or cutting instruments. 37 by other weapons, probably blunt force, whatever you want to consider in there, and then 14 by simply hands, fists, and feet. A very, very substantial majority, we're talking 202, I'm not going to sit here and do cowboy math like my colleague on the Eastern Plains, but 141 out of that 202 were handguns. That's troubling, and I can assure you of those handguns, we are talking about we are talking about stolen handguns. We are talking about, I'm speaking from law enforcement experience, I'm not speaking from a guesstimation or something that I have no experience talking about or no business talking about. Stolen handguns are used in violent crimes. 
And when we're talking the majority of those violent crimes, vast majority, committed by handguns, we're talking about stolen handguns. We're not addressing handguns in here. We're not addressing the theft. We're not addressing the punishment of people that commit crimes with firearms or steal firearms. We're talking about tools that people can purchase. And when we're talking about tools that people can purchase, we're talking about how we can take that right away for people to purchase a tool. Now the glorified mass shootings that we see on the news, the ones that are brought up because it, it's clickbait, it's something that people hear, oh no, this happened again. Those are the few mass shootings that, are, that actually make the news. And those are done with weapons that get the clickbait. Somebody did something with a long, black, scary looking firearm and we need to get it on the news. What you don't see, unless you're paying attention to our nightly news here in Colorado, your local news station, are the countless, just constantly seeing such and such, three people killed in Denver, shooting in Denver, two people dead. All this stuff happening right here in Colorado, right here in our neighborhood that we're working in on a daily basis. Those are handgun deaths. Those are gang-involved shootings and otherwise robberies gone wrong. Representative Armagest, you have one moment, one minute from him remaining. Thank, thank you, Madam Speaker. We're going the wrong direction. And I want to read another thing. When we're talking about the constant ideology in here where we, we can do this and this and protect, protect our own and let a house or let a bill get out of the house, the Senate will fix it for us. The fact that we're doing that is wrong, but especially when we know what's going to happen to this bill. In the Colorado Sun interview with Senate President Steve Fenberg, he would, he would not vote for the bill. The Boulder Democrat, I'm quoting, isn't sure House Bill 1292, which would ban the purchase, sale, and transfer of a broad swath of semi-automatic weapons defined in this measure as assault weapons, would be as effective as promised. And for those reasons, he doubts it will get through or get enough support in his chamber to pass if it makes it out of the House as expected. Representative Armagost, your time has expired. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Vote no. Representative Weinberg. Thank you, Madam Speaker. It's a privilege to serve with you. And a privilege to serve with you. Seventy-fourth General Assembly, I rise in opposition of this bill. I'm sure as you all know, I did not come from this country. I am born and raised in South Africa. And one of the reasons my family chose to leave was we were robbed at gunpoint. The only thing that prepared us to counter was having firearms. We came to this country because literally allows for people to be able to protect themselves. What's happening in our supermarkets and in our schools is horrific. But I'll tell you now, from everything I've experienced, an all-out ban doesn't fix the problem. Because there is literally no way to ban illegal firearms. I wish to convey to you today that this will be detrimental. In fact, throw the detrimental out the window. This is against the Constitution. This is not allowed. I'm clueless how we get into this chamber 
and dare try to pass a bill that is against our founding documents. I, I don't understand that. We swear an oath to the Constitution and then we write bills against them? It, it literally goes past my head every single time. I had to take the test to become a naturalized citizen of this country. A hundred plus questions of why and how this country is in existence. I would urge everyone to get a copy of the test. In fact, if you need me to print it off, I still have one. I am lost on nonsensical reason. Let me repeat that, please. Nonsensical reason to violate the oath and documents of this great country. As some of you know, I love this building with all my heart. And I'm learning a lot about it. I show people around and teach people a few things. The Supreme Court that sits where it does now has pillars moving up to a tip, which faces the road, which faces the house chambers. Architecturally, that was designed, if any of you didn't know that. And when you pass it coming up, pay attention. The reason the architects designed it so that the tip faced the House of Representative chamber was so that they were always watching us and would hope that unconstitutional law would never be put into practice. This, fellow colleagues, is unconstitutional. And a naturalized born citizen such as myself would beg you to reconsider such a nonsensical bill. There is literally no reason to putting in place anything that would hurt innocent and protect criminal. And that is literally what this does. You are not going to ban the weapons that were stolen. You are not going to ban criminals from being able to get one. When we had East High protesters come in this building last year, and I sat with them, in a, with them in a room on the third floor, and they showed me how easy it was for them to attain a firearm, this bill does not ban them from attaining a firearm. On a Sunday, coming up to one o'clock, we're discussing a third reading of a bill that has no place in the state of Colorado. I am trying deeply to understand your motives. And even on the drive down today with my kids and my wife who are in the building, because I refuse on a Sunday to be without my family, I am drawn to a non-conclusion as to why would we dare 
consider harm. Because this bill is harmful. We are put in this chamber by people. And they expect us to abide by the oaths we took. When I got sworn in on this chamber, I never thought once I would see legislation like this. And today, congressmen and congresswomen, I am appalled. My district, which is the city of Loveland, as you all understand and know, does not accept this bill. The 86,000 people in my area have charged me with the duty of telling you no. Democrats, unaffiliates, Republicans alike. Representative Weinberg, you have one minute remaining. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I plead with you, as I've done with other things, this is not the business of this legislature. And with all due respect to your ideas, this is unconstitutional, and we should stop wasting Colorado's time. I urge an over. Representative Joseph. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Members, gun violence prevention saves lives. HB 241292, which prohibits certain weapons used in mass shooting, will save lives. HB 1292 will not eliminate all gun violence, but it will curb, curb mass shootings. As someone from the Boulder community who has been touched by a mass shooting, we need this bill to protect lives in our communities. I ask all my colleagues to support this bill. Two years ago, two years ago in Boulder, we had a mass shooting, which took place on March 22, 2021. We are still recovering. Ten lives too many were taken that day. And today you have this opportunity to vote yes on this bill, HB 1292, to show to the families, the families of the victims, that we heard them and that we're working to curb gun violence in our community. In honor of these lives, I ask you to please, please vote yes. And I wanted to respond or add to some of the narratives that I heard earlier today and also Friday. Last year, there, were, there was a group that came here to the Capitol and it was a group of nurses and this bill was being heard that day. And I ended up in the basement and I was talking to one of the nurses coming from Boulder. And as we were discussing a very bill similar to this one, which was the assault weapons ban from last year, bill from last year, that community member who works at the Boulder Community Hospital told me that these type of weapons are not used for hunting. Because when hunters use these type of guns, the meat is not edible. So again, why are these type of weapons, why do they exist in our community or our communities? There was a comment made earlier about 
not being born in this country, and many of you, if you didn't know, you can hear my accent. I have an accent. Mm -hmm. And I was born in another country. I was born in Haiti. And many of you also are fully aware of what's going on in Haiti. And in Haiti is another country. We're legislating here in Colorado. That's for sure. But the thing is, the experiences that we've had in other countries around the world also help us show up as who we are as legislators. And I can tell you, as Americans, as Coloradans, there's no other country that we can run to. So that means we have to ensure that our community is safe for all of us. And I too left the country with my parents because of political and economic and social dysfunction, and we moved here. And I want the United States and Colorado to be the best country for all of us, for all of our communities. And knowing that these guns are in our communities, it makes these communities unsafe. So I ask you, please, please vote yes on this bill because it is needed. And we don't have any other country that we can run to because this is the best country on earth. So please vote yes. And also, I, want, I didn't have the opportunity to speak on Friday. And since I think I have 10 minutes, I wanted to speak a little bit more on this very issue. Because there's two things going on. There are the statistics that's available out there on gun violence and how we can prevent them. And there are the experiences that many of you, us have experienced, right? And these are powerful, powerful stories and experiences. I've experienced a mass shooting in my community, and I can tell you. And there are times, even when this bill was going to committee, I wrote a speech because I wanted to come and testify on this bill. And I can tell you, colleagues, as someone who, and I want to be careful because I don't want to take on, there were people who suffered much more than I did on March 22nd, 2021. But I can tell you, being from the Boulder community, there is some vicarious trauma or community trauma that I have experienced, even till today. When I go to grocery stores, I think about what happened on March 22nd, 2021. Because I know, even as a legislator, this badge would not protect me. What would protect all of us is this bill. So please vote yes. And yes, I understand when we look around the world, there's a lot of suffering, but gun violence and the way that we experience it in our community is an American problem. Last Friday, which was, we just passed, I wanted to tell you, we had 223 shootings in the United States that resulted in either an injury, death, or both. And Friday morning, two people were killed in Colorado Springs. If we define a mass shooting as three or more individuals being injured or dead in a single shooting incident, Colorado had 16 mass shootings in 2023. 16. There have been so many school shootings incidents in the gun violence archive have been recorded that you have to go to page 32 to reach Colorado. Just in 2024, there has been 107 mass shootings, nine, na nine mass murders, 4,481 people dead by firearms, 7,999 people injured by firearms, 381 children under the age of 18 died by firearms, 933 children under the age of 18 injured by firearms. As an attorney in this country that has given me so much, so much, I mean, the life that I lead here in this country is, 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 is my dream. I'm living my dream. But I also understand the responsibility of what it means to be an American. And I want to leave you with this. 
your constitutional right to carry or bear arms is not unlimited. Please vote yes on House Bill 241292. Thank you. Representative Frizzell. Representative DeGraff. Thank you, Madam Chair. The, that your rights are not unlimited is, they're certainly limited by responsibility, but they're not to be infringed. And that infringement is what we're talking, not just infringement, we're talking about a gross infringement today. And I do appreciate my colleagues' uh, perspective. I appreciate knowing what's going on in the world. Uh, but what we have is we don't have, we don't have a gun problem. What we have is a culture problem. And you're trying, to, you're trying to pave over a culture problem by creating a bigger problem by calling it a gun problem because you're not gonna get to the root of the problem because if your culture, if your community has a problem with shootings, it has a problem with life in that it does not value life. So we should probably get to the point where we look at why do we have communities that don't value life. Because yes, we would all like to prevent mass shootings. And the, in the time, I'm not gonna take the time to run through the statistics about the, millions of, about the millions of crimes each year that are prevented by having somebody having a weapon, brandishing a weapon if need be. I have friends that that's happened to. Somebody is approaching them, they bring out their concealed carry, tool of self-defense, and the situation is diffused. Because a firearm is a force leveler. And it, and it prevents, and it prevents the tyranny, an imposition of tyranny by one person upon another, or even a government upon another. And that is what is built into our Declaration of Independence as to why it shall not be infringed. And when, the, and, when you, and when we look at why every time that these, what you would call reasonable infringements are reasonable, well, if you go back and you say, well, every time they happen, they have not solved the problem. The problem has become worse. You can look at cities like Chicago, Boston, Los Angeles, you could, any, any place that has, what? Oh yeah, high density housing, and a low regard for life, you are going to have a problem with those types of illegal activities, and those are illegal activities. Shooting somebody is illegal. So you're not dealing, but this, again, this bill does not deal with criminals. This does not deal with criminal weapons. This does not deal with criminals. This deals specifically with law-abiding citizens. This only deals with law-abiding citizens and turning them into criminals. So if you want to look at history and why the Declaration of Independence would go into the fifth that of the self-evident truth, that when any other form of government becomes destructive to these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or abolish it, to institute a new government laying its foundations and principles, organizing the, its powers in such form as to them seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness. Prudence indeed will dictate that governments long established should not be changed for light and transient reasons. And accordingly, all experience hath shown that all mankind are more disposed to suffer while evils are sufferable. So what does it tell me when a government says citizens cannot have a gun? And his history shows, again, that when the government says you don't need a gun, you need a gun. And history really shows that when a socialist says you don't need a gun, you really need a gun. Because if we look at around the world and we say, 1911, Turkey disarmed the citizens. 1.5 million were slaughtered. Were those lives not important? 1929, Russia, citizens disarmed. 20 million Russians murdered. 1935, China, citizens disarmed. 20 million Chinese killed. 1938, Germany, citizens disarmed, 6 million Jews murdered, 19, and then obviously many more, that's only uh, one demographic. 
1956, Cambodia, citizens disarmed. One million intellectuals killed. 1964, Guatemala, citizens disarmed. 100,000 Mayan Indians massacred. 1970, Uganda, citizens disarmed. 300,000 Christians put to death. Now we can add to those, we could add to those Cuba, Brazil, Venezuela. Millions. Now, it has been said that when one person is killed, that's a tragedy. When millions are killed, that's just a statistic. But each and every one of these people was a real human being. And the fact that they were all murdered in the name of social justice or in the name of social evolution doesn't make their murder less of a murder. Now, if you want to look at where the murders occur, put the impositions there. Where do they occur? Denver. Why are we looking at legislating across all of Colorado for a problem that is largely one of high population density and a very specific regulatory style? But instead of dealing with the actual problem, instead, it's imposed new restrictions, new new restrictions on the rest of Colorado. Who doesn't have this problem? And again, these restrictions are only on law-abiding citizens. So when I was thinking about this with Thomas Jefferson, I thought, well, they, they looked at history. And those, those are all at post-Thomas Jefferson. So how would he have known? How would they have known? How would the founders have known? And I thought, oh, well, a perfect example would be the conquistadors. And we have lots of names in here, so I think that's a proud heritage of the, uh, of the, of the, uh, the lineage of the conquistadors and the, uh, and the passing on of those, of those names. In 1487, Aztecs priest would slice open the chest of the victims with their obsidian knife. Representative knives and... DeGraff, just urge you to stay on the bill. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. This is about force leveling. I'm sorry? This is about force leveling and why Thomas Jefferson would have included this. I urge you to focus on the policy before you and the argument uh, needs to relate to the outline and the content of the legislation. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'll try again. The purpose of the Second Amendment is to be a force leveling, is to resist tyranny, not just against, not just against the un, uh, unlawful uh, de deprivation of life, liberty, or property, by an individual or a government, but it's also an auxiliary right to resist tyranny. And the example would be one that Thomas Jefferson would be, fam with which he would be familiar, and that is of, of the Aztecs. And the reason that the conquistadors were recruited by the vassal states of the Aztecs is because the, Aztec, the vassal states of the Aztecs were not fond of being recruited to be human sacrifice. And so when the conquistadors showed up, Hernan Cortez and his merry men, perhaps, then they were recruited because they had firearms, because the, the, the vassal states were not, a font, not fond of having themselves and their relatives sacrificed to the gods of war or the gods of weather. So these, these ideas... That, you, that humans need to be, have a force level, have to be protected from their government, goes way back in time. It's not just a matter of new socialist governments killing their people wantonly. This goes back, this goes back to the beginning of humankind, and that's why, that's why it was ensconced. So I think that's an excellent example. Hernan Cortez leveled the playing field, removed all the people from the tyranny of the Aztec Empire, sacrificing the vassal states, people of the vassal states, for whim. Representative and DeGraff, you have one minute remaining. Thank you, Madam Chair. This bill, I disagree with my colleague in 80% that this would take, because this, uh, this, takes the, the two or three page definition of 
every single what it calls assault weapons even includes pistols, includes pistol grips. Pistols have pistol grips. And he's semi-automatic. And I, I'll contend that I think this really only would allow smoothbore flintlock muskets in some way, single-shot flintlock muskets in some way, shape, or form. This is a, this is a gross overstep. And before we even had any talk about any sort of agreement to civility, and I'm all for that, we took an oath, which far exceeds that. This is not an oath. This is not just some, just some random allegiance to a piece of paper. This is an oath that we took to support our Constitution as founded in the Declaration of DeGraff, Independence. your time has expired. Representative Frizzell. Thank you, Madam Speaker. When I spoke on this bill on Friday, I talked a fair amount about some of the items in the Declaration. I'm just going to say this again. This, the, the language in this bill is inflammatory and candidly offensive, and I find it disrespectful to say, and I'll read this, the firearms industry has specifically marketed assault weapons as tactical hyper-masculine and military style in a manner that, over, that overtly appeals to the very people most likely to acquire such weapons as a means to gain infamy as a mass shooter. I, I think that that would be news to the millions and millions of gun owners who own their firearms legally. I did not acquire my firearm with the idea of becoming a mass shooter. I don't find firearms hyper-masculine. I think that, I think that that's disrespectful. This bill does not address the real issues that we have in this state. It does nothing. It is criminalizing the sale of large swaths of firearm types. And what it is doing, what it is for sure doing, is reducing the legal inventory of legal firearms dealers. So, I'm going to say this again, I said it last week, let's be honest. Let's be honest about our motives. Let's be honest about the purpose of this bill and others like it. Let's be at least honest. You want to put these businesses out? Of, you, want, you want them to shut down so that the only place you can acquire a firearm is through a black market situation or across the state line? Let's just be honest. This bill is making law-abiding citizens into criminals while giving the actual people breaking our laws, those people who are making Colorado one of the least safe states in the country, a complete pass. We're giving them a pass. We are saying it is not okay to own a firearm for safety, security, or sport. Um, I would humbly disagree with my good colleague from Boulder about these firearms not being useful for hunting. Uh, I lack the in-depth knowledge and I do not hunt, so um, I believe that one of my colleagues will be addressing that later with more specific information. And I want to talk about one thing. This kicking the can down the road of legislation that we appear to be doing in this session. 
The idea that we cannot fix bills or kill bills or at least make them relevant in this chamber is deeply disturbing to me. It is irresponsible. It is our responsibility to make a bill as good as it can be before we send it out of here. It is our responsibility. That's why we're here. It's not to kick the can down the road hoping the Senate's going to do something. Come on. Take responsibility. I have seen this time and time and time again sitting on the four committees of reference that I get to sit on of a bad bill getting laid over or a bad bill. We won't kill it. We won't kill a bill. Let's, let's take responsibility. Members, this bill does nothing about the real problems we have. And if we want to solve real problems in this chamber, let's do that. Let's do the right thing. Please vote no. Representative Hamrick. Thank you, Madam Speaker. It's a pleasure to serve with you. And a pleasure to serve with you. I want to thank the sponsors for bringing this very, very important bill. Columbine, Sandy Hook, Parkland, Uvalde, STEM school. I could read the rest of the schools that have experienced shootings, but my time would be exhausted. So I'm just going to remind you all that I've been a high school teacher for 32 years. Um, I teach in an area where we have active shooter events, not just drills. I was a teacher, high school teacher, when Columbine happened. And it was kind of before cell, most kids had cell phones. So it was all kind of a mystery about which school it was. We didn't know what school it was. And um, we had one of my friends, my office mate, his wife worked at Columbine. And he had no idea if she was safe or anything. And um, as teachers, you know, most of us had kids and our children were in other schools and we didn't know if it was that school. And it was just, it was a nightmare. And, um, you know, as a teacher, your duty is to your students. And so, um, you know, we, we just sort of calmed our kids, our students, um, as much as we could and, and waited for news and just kept them in our classroom all day. They didn't, had no passing periods or anything like that. Um, and then afterwards, when we found out it was Columbine and the, the, the murders that happened there, um, the kids wouldn't come to school. We had really high um, absenteeism um, for a few weeks after Columbine. And then every 420, about a third of the kids for many years wouldn't come to school. The parents wouldn't send them to school for fear of them basically getting murdered. Um, and a lot of teachers were really nervous too, right? But you showed up on 420. Um, and you, you know, kept your chin up and you taught your subject and you hoped that someone with an assault weapon wasn't going to burst through into your classroom where you'd have to figure out how to protect yourself um, and your students. My community also is um, where the Aurora 16 shooting happened. <laughs> um, and our students' leadership group was there. These were juniors and it was in the summer. And, um, and uh, they were in the actual room with their murderer and one of my kids, that's what I call my students, shielded a mother and a child from being killed and he was shot in the back. Now he survived, but physically he survived, but mentally, you know, uh, it, it takes a toll. And as, as my um, friend from Boulder talked about, um, when a mass shooting happens in a community, it ripples out into the whole community. Everyone is affected um, by that. So thank, thank you for standing. I really appreciate it. Um, so since Columbine, there's more, been more than 370,000 students who have experienced gun violence in 404 schools. And who knows, there could be another shooting today. We're in the area of mass shootings. We're in the era of lockdown drills. Um, and when I speak with 
with parents and teachers and students, their biggest ask is a bill that addresses um, assault weapons. So let's look at the evidence. A growing body of research shows that states can reduce gun violence by prohibiting assault weapons and high capacity magazines. States with restrictions on magazine size experience mass shootings at less than half the rates without restrictions. According to Dr. Michael Siegel, a researcher at Boston University, whether a state has a large capacity ammunition magazine ban is a single best predictor of the mass shooting rates in that state. I'll read that again. Whether a state has a large capacity ammunition magazine ban is a best single predictor of the mass shooting rates in that state. A 2018 study found that mass shooting fatalities were 70% less likely to occur in 1994 to 2004 when the federal prohibition on assault weapons and high capacity magazines was in effect. Then, during the 12 years studied before and after the prohibition, researchers estimate a federal assault ban would have prevented 314 of 448 mass shooting deaths that occurred during the studied periods where assault weapon ban was not in effect. In Virginia, the assault weapon ban was associated with significant reductions in the share of guns used in crimes that were equipped with high capacity magazines, down to an all-time low of 10% in 2004. When the prohibition expired, the share of Virginia crime guns equipped with high capacity magazines rapidly increased, reaching 22% by 2010. The, the, this legislation, these types of laws, they work. And so, as a parent and a teacher and a legislator, I urge you to vote aye on 24-12-92. Thank you. Representative Holtorf. Thank you, Madam Speaker, esteemed colleagues. I urge everyone in this chamber to vote no on this bill. Allow me to explain, as we talk about policy, as we talk about policy that will affect or try to curtail um, these mass casualty events. You see, I'm looking at a news article here that just was published just a few days ago in Australia. Old Australia. <clears throat> Our brethren from down under. Well, ladies and gentlemen, they have, their country has one of the strictest gun laws, arguably in any of the first world countries. Yet I read in this article that six people are dead and eight more injured after a 40-year-old man wielding a knife went on a rampage Saturday afternoon at the Westfield Bondi Junction. And I believe that's like a shopping mall for us here in Colorado. So, <clears throat> if you think this is going to stop mass casualty events, I guess, and we're worried about all these things, maybe we should outlaw kitchen knives. because it's the same logic, and it's a flawed logic. It doesn't work as you violate the Second Amendment with this unconstitutional legislation. It doesn't work. Allow me to continue. Fortunately, a lone police officer was there to neutralize a suspect who went on a stabbing spree at this Westfield Bondi Junction. Does anybody know what this female used to stop the assailant? How about a firearm? The very thing that you're trying to stop with this policy You see, thank God that that woman had a firearm. Now, she was a law enforcement person because as a citizen, you can't have them. But a good old country gentleman like me would have done the same thing without hesitation.
I know how to put three around a quarter in pretty short order. Yeah, that rhymes. You see, it's not the person, it's the spirit of the person. And it even says in this story, this person was deranged. He was on a killing spree, obviously mentally unstable. And see, that's the issue. Now, I do want to cancel out a myth stated by my colleague from Boulder that she said the nurse told her that if you use a, um, this type of firearm in hunting that the meat's not any good. Well, that's completely and wholly false. It doesn't matter what firearm you use. Representative Holtorf, just a reminder, we do not need to uh, characterize others' statements. Just encourage you to speak your own truth. Uh, well, ma'am, I'm going to speak the truth, but I, want, I won't talk about my colleague from Boulder. I'll just talk about the truth. The fact that and it doesn't matter what type of firearm you use, okay, what matters is the projectile, the caliber of the projectile, and it doesn't matter if it's single shot, bolt action, lever action, semi-automatic, it matters none. What does matter is the placement of the shot and how quickly you do the proper techniques to make sure that the meat does not get fouled after you put down the game. Those of us in the hunting world understand this. So it matters not and means not and doesn't mean a thing in hunting. Just for the record, that's the truth. Now, I want to talk about this bill. It's full of flawed assumptions, and I'll just start out with the uh, declaration here. And I'm going to substitute some words, mass shooting for mental health. Because really, as we've talked about in this chamber, it is not the hunk of metal that you hold in your hand. It is the will and the intent of the mentally deranged person who holds that, whatever it is, a knife in the case of Australia. In Boulder, it was a firearm like these, but it didn't matter. That young man was mentally deranged and had serious issues, and it's a fact. So mental health shootings are a significant component of this distinctly American academic of gun violence, epidemic of gun violence. It's absolutely about mental health and our lack of respect for life at every level. Because we don't really get care that much about life, apparently. We don't want to preserve it, so we just take it. And it's easy to take. For those of us that have been downrange, we know how easy it is to take. And yeah, we come home with a little bit of our own issues that we got to shake off. Now, I'm going to continue on page three here as preventable gun deaths from all mental health and deranged persons who have hostility towards citizens devastate families and communities. It isn't the gun, it's the person behind the gun who has a mental health problem. In almost every case, ladies and gentlemen, there is a mental health problem behind the person that is exacting the violence to do criminal harm and kill people. Those people should have the absolute most severe punishment, including the death penalty. So they are not allowed in their sick, twisted world to be propped up as some type of hero. I'll continue. I'll go to the next one here. In recent years, Americans have endured an unfathomable average of more than one mass shooting per day. Consistently, these shootings and incidents in the United States involve a mentally deranged criminal who disregards life and uses a weapon to take life. Doesn't matter if it's single shot or high capacity. Doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you make them illegal. I can go out on the street right now on Colfax, talk to about three people right across the street at that little stop over there. You all know where it is. And I can have a pistol 
in about five minutes or less. And it'll cost me less than $200, maybe $200 or less. And I can do whatever I want. Doesn't matter what laws you all pass in here. It's still going to happen. Criminals aren't going to respect this unless criminals are properly punished. I'll go to the last page here. Colorado, mentally health, mentally deranged persons in Colorado have become household names because of mass shootings. And I can name all the places. But in every case, they were mentally deranged criminals who had no respect for human life and were taking out their punishment on the rest of society for their mental health problems and their lack of respect for others. I just want to point out these false statements. I will talk a little bit about... Representative Holtorf, you have one minute remaining. Okay. I do want to talk a little bit about gun violence. You know, we talked about Haiti, and um, Haiti has some of the very biggest restrictions on guns. But right now, ladies and gentlemen, they have a gang war going on, and their country has fallen into disarray. Despite all those laws, like this, like this very law you present, how is it that the country is falling apart? And yes, there's lots of violence, gang violence, gun violence. It's lack of respect for human life. Representative Holtorf, back to this bill and the and state of Colorado. And lack of respect for life. So all these laws in the world aren't fixing the problem. You all need to understand that. And the worst part about it is they're grossly and wholly unconstitutional. So I'm going to vote no. Because it's not going to fix the problem that you purport to Holtorf, fix. Representative Holtorf, your time has expired. Thank you. Representative Hartsook. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Good afternoon. Pleasure and an honor to serve with you today. It is an honor to serve with you. Thank you very kindly. On Friday, I spoke rather extensively on this. I had some numbers that showed the United States at number 64, but what I would like to do is zero in on one key aspect that I mentioned on Friday and I think is very relevant to this bill and to how we do things not only within this chamber, but in the world. Two, three major emotions in life, love, hate, fear. Of those, fear can drive people to do what all of us would consider insane things. Hate will do the same thing. This bill intends to criminalize dozens and dozens of weapons. The weapon is an inanimate object. It, it has no emotions. It has no capability of doing anything except use as a tool by an individual. And how that individual uses it will determine if it's good or bad. If it's through hatred or fear or love for self-defense or for food. No matter what you outlaw, no matter what we take away from citizens, criminals, people that hate, will always find a way to do their evil deeds. Nothing has stopped them since the beginning of time, whether it's a stone, swords, knives, rifles, shotguns, trucks full of explosives, chemical poisons. There, there's thousands upon thousands of cases around the world. We here are very focused on what happens in the United States. We tend to lose sight of it in comparison to everything else that goes wrong on around the world, where there's mass executions, there's mass chemical poisonings, 
And yet, through fear, we believe that if we get rid of these weapons, our kids will be safe. I've told you before, I've seen what happens to the schools when they blow them up, because I've been there. Many of you have talked about how you've seen the shootings, and I've seen that too. I would urge you not to let fear drive legislation. It doesn't produce good results. And in this case, it will not alter the course of the crazy psychopaths out there that hate or are intent on causing harm. They will find another weapon of choice, truck of explosives, truck of chemicals. The list is almost endless in today's world of readily available technology via the internet and a little few things that you can buy at almost any store in any community. And it doesn't matter if it's out in the farming communities of ammonium nitrate, in the cities, it doesn't matter. These are easily bought items. So what we need to look at is what is our society wanting to do? We need to focus on, at least my suggestion would be, to focus on the families in teaching. We used to teach hunter safety. We teach driver safety. We teach driver's education. We teach how to handle a vehicle. We teach what happens when you're hurtling down the freeway at 65 or 75 miles an hour on the various speed limits here in the state of Colorado. But we don't teach hunter safety anymore. We don't teach discipline when it comes to weapons. I grew up with that. We don't teach respect anymore. Everyone wants their way. So then fear drives us to let's get rid of things, be it cars, be it guns. But we're not addressing the root problem. And until we address that root problem, ladies and gentlemen, the statistics are not going to change, only the methodology. I not only urge a no vote on this, but I urge we get back down to the table and look at how we address the root problem. Thank you. Representative Bradley. I have a very hard time listening to legislator after legislator come up here and speak in favor of this bill in the name of safety, in the name of protecting kids, when these same legislators voted against an amendment for $2 million for school safety. The House will stand in a brief recess.
The House will come back to order. Representative Bradley, please proceed. Thank you. In my opinion, this bill will not curb mass shootings and it will not address school safety. We should support legislation that would help our school safety problem, like software and hardening our schools. Those are the things that are going to curb mass shootings in schools. Think about that, Colorado. In one breath, we advocate for significantly limiting your ability to protect yourself and your family. And in the next breath, we are advocating for lesser sentences for criminals. And let's not forget that they are also, we are also stripping away the ability for law enforcement to do their job. The mayor just cut $8.4 million in budget cuts from law enforcement and fire services to pay for the migrant crisis. And if that's not enough, this bill is tying the hands of the majority of the people of Colorado, the law-abiding citizens who will never commit a crime, who follow the fullest extent of the law, and we are waging war on their ability to provide safety to their families and themselves. Abolitionists and socialists abolish our constitutional right to defend ourselves, all while offering zero solution to the rampant crime affecting our state. 2019, in Colorado, violent crime was 25,291 incidents, and in 2023, that number jumped to 29,994. Property crime went from 157 and 50 to 171, 515 in just four years. And in those four years, we enacted more and more bills to tie the hands of law-abiding citizens all while defunding our police. And we're doing it again to the tune of $8.4 million just in the city of Denver. No solution, just more problems for the people of Colorado who want to defend themselves. And I wanna go over this statistic one more time. The Violence Project published the most comprehensive mass shooting database, and what did their research show? These aren't just Googling statistics, this was a major database that the federal assault weapons ban became effective on September 24th, 1994. Before this was enacted, the database showed that there were 25 mass shootings, resulting in 156 total fatalities, with assault weapons being used in six. During the ban, 33 mass shootings, so eight more, resulted in 173 total fatalities, where assault weapons were used in seven out of 33. And in the post-ban decade, there were 46, so we've doubled it. We've restricted weapons and we've doubled the amount of mass shootings, resulting in 30, 328 fatalities. So tell me what this bill is going to do, because I will tell you, with evidence to support it, over 3 million crimes are prevented on a yearly basis, or almost 8,000 by brandishing a gun. Every year, 400,000 life-threatening violent crimes are prevented using firearms. And after July 1st, per this bill, every victim of crime and future victims of crime will be prevented from using upwards of 90% of the guns listed in this bill under the false premise that they are assault weapons. And we had a statement earlier from a nurse who told us last year that semi-automatic rifles aren't used for hunting because it makes the meat inedible which tells me there is a horrific lack of understanding about guns. And in that lack of understanding, you're willing to vote against my God-given constitutional rights. Hunting is about the round and the gun. Different sized guns for different animals. My boys hunt elk. They certainly don't use the same caliber ammunition and gun to take down an elk that they do for pheasant and rabbit hunting but maybe you should come with me and go hunting so we can all learn a little bit more about calibers and guns. Blatantly restricting the purchase of firearms for me and my children in the future, is that what you think is gonna stop crime? Is that what you think is gonna stop mass shootings? Fewer than 1% of firearms are used in the commission of a crime, but over 3 million are used to prevent them. And the bill sponsor's answer to this is to ban guns. You're willing to make the majority of us, law-abiding citizens, future victims. And if we're talking about assault weapons, 
then let's ban knives. The representative already came up here and talked about what happened in Australia. Six people died. Horrific deaths. Probably praying that someone would show up with a gun. And guess what? Someone did. Someone showed up with a gun, killed the person, so that no more lives were taken. And maybe we should ban forks. Maybe we should ban cars. Because they kill more people every day than guns do. And let's talk about the fastest growing statistics of gun owners, and it's not white conservative men. It is women like me, minorities, members of the LGBTQ, and I find it appalling that this bill states that the firearms industry has specifically marketed assault weapons as tactical, hyper-masculine, and military style in a manner that overtly appeals to the very people most likely to acquire such weapons as a means to gain infamy as a mass shooter. You're talking about my children who have no want or desire to participate in taking the life of anything. This is such an egregious and grossly inflammatory statement. Women like me want to protect ourselves. Not hyper-masculine, give me a break. A Pew Center study in September of 2023 states that 40% of Democrats who don't own a gun, said that they would consider owning one in the future, will hurry before July 1st. 56% of black non-owners, 48% of whites, 40% of Hispanics, and 38% of Asian non-gunners gun owners said they would be gun owners one day. But in Colorado, because of legislation like this, hurry. In 2012, the Pew Research Center conducted that only 29% of African-American households viewed guns as a positive, and in 2015, that same survey showed a dramatic jump to 59%, where now a majority of African Americans see guns as not only a positive thing, but in many cases, a necessity. And it also shows that single African American women are now one of the fastest growing demographic groups in the African American community who are purchasing guns for what? For protection. And you know why that gun ownership is increasing across all demographics is because people don't feel safe. And in Colorado, you shouldn't feel safe. You should own guns to protect yourself. Colorado is the fourth, fourth least safe state in our country. One of the highest for combined property and violent crime rates according to the FBI. But let's strip our rights to be able to defend ourselves as of J July 1st. Guns are the great equalizer. My ability to protect myself, my home, and my children will not be stripped. In closing, our constituents voted each of us into office at the very least to uphold the Constitution, the oath we all swore to protect. And I'll remind you, we put our hands, most of us on Bibles, others on other things. I do swear that I will support the Constitution of the United States, the Constitution of Colorado. Documents that protect us against tyrannical government, and I would now say against tyrannical legislators who call our Constitution just a piece of parchment paper. Democrats and Republican constituents... Representative Bradley, you just called us tyrannical legislators? No, I said... I, no, I said against. Against. I didn't, I didn't call anyone. I didn't impugn anyone. Against. Representative Bradley. You can take it... Yeah. You have... One minute remaining, I will ask you to wrap up your comments. In which part of the Constitution says that our right to bear arms, bear arms is limited? The law-abiding people of Colorado will resist. We will not comply. We will not continue to let legislators make us victims while letting criminals roam our streets with less penalties for their crimes. And you can be elated now if this bill goes through the House, but understand that our fight is just getting started against anyone who votes for this barbaric and unconstitutional attack on our freedoms. Representative V. Hill. Thank you, Madam Speaker. It's a privilege to serve with you. It is a privilege to serve with you. Colleagues, my constituency is not easy to please on this issue. Um, I think like so many of us, uh, it's not, not, not uh, there's no vote that we can take on here, especially in issues like this where somebody's not going to be unhappy. Uh, but I've been delving a lot into this topic to get better educated, wrap my head around what kind of gun-related policies I can get behind and which ones I won't be able to get behind. I just simply cannot be all or nothing on this issue. So I, I really hope 
Um, I really hope uh, the dozens listening at home and, and all of you can appreciate uh, the, the research that went into this. I haven't heard anybody else yet state our, uh, quote our state constitution on this issue, so I'm going to go ahead and do so. Article 2, Section 13, the right of no person to keep and bear arms in defense of his home, person, and property, or aid of the civil power when they're too legally summoned shall be called into question, but nothing herein contained shall be construed to justify the practice of carrying concealed weapons. That's what it says. Uh, and this is our state constitution. This is ratified almost a full century after the federal constitution. I think we would have to imagine that the uh, drafters and the folks who ratified our state constitution uh, passed, I guess, passed a document that's just in direct violation of the federal constitution, I guess, if you want to um, somehow interpret that to mean uh, that the Second Amendment means all gun laws are inherently constitutional. I can't get there. I can't get to that conclusion. So my understanding of how this plays out legally, and I, and I read up on some of the case law, is that a gun regulation in this state needs to pass two critical tests. Um, so one, one is that the, state, the state's intent of the law must be a reasonable exercise of our policing power. That is, the governing body has to demonstrate that this law is tied to a goal in the public interest, not just to take away somebody's gun, but to promote public safety and welfare. And it must not have the effect of nullifying the right to bear arms for a constitutionally protected purpose. And we have two that are identified, defense of home, self, and property, and being called up for the civil defense. I would argue possibly that second purpose, not super relevant in, in a time where we have uh, the National Guard, but perhaps a constitutional co uh, scholar can correct me. So reading up on some of these decisions, I've learned a few things. Court said in the Robertson decision, 1994, this is a direct quote from our court. We have consistently concluded that the state may regulate the exercise of that right under its inherent police power so long as the exercise of that power is reasonable. And what they've concluded over and over again is if you're not getting rid of everything that would be necessary for defense of home, self, and property, then the right to that defense remains intact. In case you're ever worried that the court might drop the ball on the, the nullification, hopefully that's the correct <laughs> correct uh, conjugation of that, and ultimately uphold a bill that disarms the people. Please do as I have done, read up on People versus Nakamura decision 1936. Court ruled that a law preventing non-citizens from owning or possessing firearms was unconstitutional because while it was ostensibly to preserve the supply of wild game, that was the purpose of the law, the obvious outcome was that all non-citizen people were effectively disarmed. And they said, by the way, this is another quote, that the legislature cannot disarm any class of persons or deprive them of the right to bear arms in defense of home, person, or property. And under this constitutional guarantee, there is no distinction between unnaturalized foreign-born residents and citizens. And I'll just invite everyone to put that in your pipe. You might want to smoke it later. So, so perhaps one could argue that having weapons of warfare in civil society is reasonable. And you might even persuade people that your way of thinking on that, and we might disagree about the policy of this bill. But I think this idea that this body doesn't even have the right to pass such legislation and that won't hold up in court is a completely different one. And, and honestly, if, if that's what you're hoping for, maybe let the bill pass and let the court sort that out. That would seem like it would actually be a really welcome outcome for, for those who don't want this ban to go into effect. The other thing I want to speak to, as long as I still have time, and how am I doing, Madam Speaker? I'm sorry, I'm bad at keeping track. You have just over five minutes. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I do want to speak to this presumption that I hear over and over again, that as long as a weapon is legal, that it's legal for everyone. I want to share with you a couple of examples I have encountered being around these weapons in my own community. On one occasion, pointed directly at me and a whole lot of friends in peaceful protest, standing outside of City Hall. And we're talking about, like, on the stand, pointed directly at us from the roof of an adjacent building, a well-known hate group, lots of violent threats against our community, full, well, full knowledge that they mean us harm. And then less than a year later, a march with a lot of that same crowd where a couple of the people who joined us showed up to that march, similarly armed. I didn't love it, but the open carry is legal. They had to, the right to do it. And I probably don't have to tell you this, but I will. The right-wing hate group that pointed their rifles directly at us, no law uh, enforcement Representative Vigil. Representative Vigil. Yes, Madam Speaker. Let's stand in a brief recess. Okay.
The House will come back to order. Representative Vigil, please proceed. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and I um, and I appreciate the clarification about uh, where I might have misstepped there, and I'm I'm happy to to uh, course correct a little bit. Um, so I mean, what it, the situ couple of situations I was describing, and I'll just kind of come back to that and then wrap up, um, was that there, I've had some instances, instances um, in my community, um, identical weapons, very similar situations, one of them arguably uh, more directly threatening, uh, in which no, no intervention occurred. There was, there was no law enforcement intervention. There were actually um, families with children at that uh, protest who had guns pointed at them. They chose to just leave. And less than a year later, very similar situation, um, except this time a, a peaceful march. A couple of folks showed up with very similar weapons, and uh, as it happens, they were um, arrested and charged with felony menacing for doing so. And so I, I struggle with this idea that, that somehow uh, people being similarly armed has some sort of leveling or equalizing force. Um, and it's not a huge shock to me, I think just looking over our historical record in this country, uh, every time the government actually, our government actually has turned weapons against its citizenry. It's, there's a few specific targets. It's usually organized labor. It's usually a community of color. Um, but we've seen some standoffs where not a drop of blood spilled. I, I just encourage everyone to look, look at the totality of this situation and ask yourself, because you'll have to forgive me, I don't share this passion for preserving this right specifically to resist tyranny, if that's the way it's going to play out in real life. So while my constituency, like so many of ours, have mixed feelings on this, you can't make everybody happy. I've, I've chosen to get into what the Constitution tells us is fair game, to look at what the data tells us is possible as far as improving public health and safety. And you can only be in this chamber for so long is the way I feel about it. I can only be here for up to eight years. I could cross the hall and do another eight years if everything's timed out just perfectly. I have to live with this person for the rest of my life. I would like to sleep at night and so I will be voting yes on this bill. Thank you, and thank you again, Madam Speaker, for your helpful correction. Thank you, Representative. Representative Bradfield. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, last Friday, I stood right here and looked at the camera and told the people of uh, House District 21 that I do not support this uh, bill and uh, that I definitely would vote no. Well. Much to my surprise, my email has just been blowing up in support of my vote. And so I'm just coming back on the camera saying nothing in what I have heard today makes me feel any different than I did on Friday. And yes, when this comes to a vote, it'll be no on the board. Thank you. Representative Amabile. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, so I wanted to talk a little bit about this bill. Uh, I, this is my fourth year in the legislature, and we have run quite a number of gun violence prevention pieces of legislation. And every single time, in every committee, and in every hearing, in every floor vote, the moms in the red shirts have been here and why, you might ask, why are they here? Why do they give up their Sunday, their Thursday night until midnight, their Wednesday all day and all night? And I think it's because they're scared of the direction that we are heading. They have lived through Columbine. They've lived through Sandy Hook. They've lived through King Supers. And they, this bill is the thing that they have wanted us to do the entire time I have been here. And today, we're doing that. And they're here again. And they'll be in the Senate. And they will be writing to the governor because they want their kids to be safe. They want to be able to go grocery shopping and not worry. And they're willing to put in their time and their life towards this cause. And we all have to be willing to do that too because this is going to make a difference. All of the things we have done are going to make a difference. We're going to save lives and we're going to change the culture 
We heard a lot about that today. And this is one of the ways that we're going to do that. So I just wanted to say thank you for bringing the bill. Thank you all for being here. And please, let's vote yes today. Representative Catlin. Thank you, Madam Speaker. It's still an honor to serve with you. It is still an honor to serve with you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Members, I'm here because this, the bill creates a definition of certain weapons as assault weapons. However, that is expanded to include any semi-automatic rifle with a detachable magazine or capable of modification of detachable magazine. That stretched it out an awful long way. The other thing is, is that the statistics say that most of this is done by handguns. And that reveals that banning assault weapons will do little to nothing to address the issue of mass shootings. There's not one single cohesive definition of mass shooting that exists or that is provided within the bill. A mass shooting is defined by Statistica, or Statista, as a shooting where three or more people are killed. The state with the highest number of mass shootings is California. Yet they have the stiffest gun laws in the, in the union. Where states with the lowest number of mass shootings, as Alabama, Iowa, and Arizona, also happen to have the most lenient to non-existent gun laws. This gun law is not going to change what's happening. They can't demonstrate that it's going to make a great difference. And in my district, which granted is a long way from here, what we're talking about are AR platforms, turkey shotguns, semi-automatic shotguns, and semi-automatic hunting rifles. I'm still not clear whether or not an out-of-state hunter can have one. Can they bring it into the state? Those questions are still in my mind. The other thing that I cannot give one of these weapons to my son, and I can't sell one, I understand that, and I can't go buy one. If you have one, I guess you can use it. I'm still not sure as to whether or not parts can be purchased to repair them. I think we're trying to do something that's out there that we probably can't fix. We keep talking about Boulder, but I remember with Boulder, one of the things that happened was the family did not exercise our red flag law in order to play, preclude that tragedy. We've done a number of things since I've been here to try and help with the problems. They haven't worked. Why? People don't participate is why. We've strengthened red flag laws. We've done a number of different things. But we have not done anything about what goes on in the mind of those that do this terrible, terrible thing. We're not addressing or trying to find the individuals that may show tendencies to this. My heart goes out to people that their loved ones were victims and that the families continue to suffer. But a broad brush on Anybody or a large sector of this state is not the answer. I think there's things that we can do in every one of our communities to help with this. But the idea that you're not going to be allowed to buy certain products, 
even if they look like they've been on television in the hands of a terrorist. I understand the fear factor in that. I had a man once that worked for me. And he drove around with it on the, on the dash of his pickup. And the people that he serviced were afraid of him. Probably rightly so. One day he ended up in my office because there was a claim and there was, a, there was an accusation. And I asked him, you know, man, I, I guess I don't understand. These people are our neighbors. You tell me why you're afraid of them, that you think you need to have one of these on the dash of your pickup. I guess he had never really thought about that. He told me I'm not afraid of them. I said, well, you're certainly saying you are by showing it to the good people of this valley. If you have a purpose for it, I understand. Every man that worked for me had a rifle behind the seat of his pickup in order to take care of muskrats, beavers, and the other vermin that were interfering with how we took care of that natural resource, and that's water. There was a change in my men after that. They all put it behind the seat of their pickup. If they needed it, they took it out and they used it. I think a lot of this is fear on everybody's part. I don't have one. I do have hunting rifles. And now I'm gonna have to go home and figure out whether or not they're gonna be legal, that I can pass them on or that I can give them. And that's not right. The people that are not in this building are questioning it. Have we done enough to inform them or will we just issue a headline and they can figure it out? People, we are here to govern, not to rule. And we're taking steps closer and closer to ruling rather than governing. I understand the fears and the, and the pain and the anxiety and the need for something to happen, especially from the other, from part of our community. Maybe it's 50-50, I don't know. But are we talking, are we trying to find out? Well, I'm not sure. The heavy hand of government is too heavy in a lot of places. And this is one of those where it always shows up. But this body has done numerous things to try and address these problems. Have we given them enough time to work? I can't tell you. Do they deserve the time to work? Yes, I think they do. Just in, so, in just the short time of this session, we've done some things about gun violence and about weapons. Certainly, there's not been enough time for those to work. And in my area and in my district, this is a no vote. And I understand that. I don't know if there's anybody watching from out there. But the point I'm trying to make is that we're going to rule everyone with this. People are going to have to try and go figure out what can I keep, what do I need to do, and why am I needing to do it? Those are the questions that worry me. Representative Catlin, you have one minute remaining. Thank you. I didn't, must have got carried away. Didn't realize I would take 10 minutes. But colleagues, this is a serious subject, believe me, and I understand that. And I understand the passion on both sides. But I today would still ask you to vote no on this bill because I think there's gonna be so many people that are honest, solid citizens that are gonna worry about whether or not what I own is okay to own 
even though it says you can't buy it. I get all of that. But perceptions in this day and age are reality. Let's think about that. Please vote no. Representative Brown. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Just briefly, I believe that our kids deserve to be safe at school and in their communities. And time and again, certain weapons are used in mass shootings. You know, it, it's hard for me to argue that knives can do the damage that an assault weapon can. Pulse, Las Vegas, Uvalde could not have happened with knives. My district knows that weapons of war have no place in our community, and we are safer without them. Two years ago, our communities joined forces to ban these weapons from our community. Regional efforts like this are important, but they are not enough. We need state action to protect our communities. I will reiterate that no right in the Bill of Rights is absolute. And in fact, the Second Amendment contains the words well-regulated. So the state not only has the ability to act, but it has the duty to protect our kids and our communities. So I would ask for an I vote on this bill. Thank you. Representative Taggart. Thank you, Madam Speaker. We all have our experiences. I had the misfortune to lead a group of people in our North American headquarters of our company that were 10 miles from Sandy Hook, Connecticut, in an absolutely beautiful little town called Newtown, Connecticut. And I watched in horror many of my employees that had children in that school. Thank the Lord, none of them lost their children that day, but the pain that it put them through, I watched for weeks and months thereafter. And we did everything we could as an organization to help them. So I too have the experience with this concern. But having said that, one of the things I think we all look at are the groups in our state that either support, amend, monitor, or oppose one of our bills in this house. And in this particular case, when we talk about safety and protection, the two foremost groups that are on this list of opposing happen to be the chiefs of police and their association across the state, along with the county sheriffs. They're responsible for our law enforcement. They're responsible for the protection of all citizens. They're responsible for our safety. And they oppose this bill. And when I talk to ours, they oppose it for one reason. They don't believe this is the answer. I won't repeat what many of my colleagues said. We had an amendment yesterday. Was it yesterday or the day before? <laughs> Whew. Um, I got people over there that are gonna call me Papa again. Um, on Friday, we had an amendment that I thought helped this bill and addressed the mental health, which we know is the common theme. And we know that's why our police chiefs and our sheriffs don't think this bill is going to be effective. That amendment passed, and then I heard how 
other associations felt that that wasn't needed. And then the amendment was struck down in the cow as a part of this bill. I walked away Friday night scratching my head. If that was effective, why are we still in the same boat today that we've been for many, many years? Our issue is mental health. It's not a piece of metal. And I don't understand what it's going to take us to address the core issues that cause for these unbelievable tragedies. I lived through one. I wish this was the answer. I can't vote yes on this. I don't, when I have to believe, when law enforcement says this is not the answer, we need to listen to them. Thank you. Assistant Majority Leader Bacon. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, colleagues, thank you for the discussion on this bill. Um, since I have been a part of the legislature, I have always had the privilege of serving on uh, state affairs or judiciary. And so since I've been here, I've, I've been able to hear a lot of bills regarding the use of firearms uh, well into the night, if you will. Um, and so first, I'd just like to start by saying, you know, there were facets of the conversation when we were in committee. I want to thank all the witnesses who came in, even witnesses who would deem themselves on the opposing side of me. Um, I did learn things. I want to thank uh, the gun owners and the gun uh, store owners and those who train uh, other people on how to use firearms. For the, the people who did speak with me uh, with kindness, I want to thank them for that kindness and I want to thank them for opening up their world to me. There were plenty of people uh, who were not kind, but I don't think I should spend much time there. And I want to, so I want to say thank you to that. Um, I also want to acknowledge some of my colleagues. You know, there's been a lot of Twitter fodder. Um, and I don't even know if that's what it's called now. But I just want to differentiate myself. I am Representative Jennifer Bacon. I am not someone else who represents Denver, who has the same skin color as me. Uh, people tend to mix us up, so I want to own my own words, particularly as I speak here today. Um, you know, when the Aurora shooting happened, I was actually at that same theater the night before at a midnight showing. I saw Prometheus, I don't know, it was 2012, nobody might remember that movie. Um, but I was at the same theater the night before at that same time for the showing. And, you know, kind of like what happens in the news, like if they say it's snowing somewhere in Colorado, my grandmother calls me like, are you in a blizzard? You know, but when that happened, everybody thought I was still at that theater. And even though I wasn't there the night after, I had three students who were and a friend. And the night when it uh, happened, myself, I was also a dean at a school, myself and our our school leader got on the phone to figure out if any of our students were there. And that's how we found out that we had students were there. One of, one of them was shot, but she survived. Um, and a colleague of mine was also shot and he survived. And then was the first time, because we had to figure out how to support our students, even though we were not in school, it, wasn't, uh, it was summer. We had to figure out how to support our students through understanding what was happening. And that was the first time I was formally asked in any sort of authority position, how can this happen? How can we do something to prevent this? And that was in, that was like 12 years ago. And as I ran for office, the big reason why I ran for office was because of my experiences with my students. And I just wanted to be in a position to one day be able to answer that question. What can we do to prevent this? So I do want to talk about prevention because I've heard a lot today about force multipliers, or I, I don't think I have it right, but hardening of 
targets. And, you know, we've heard a lot of history lessons and whatnot. And I have to say, I really struggle with that argument of, you know, meeting force with force because on the one hand, I can hear the arguments that force and having these weapons is how America became America in the sense of, you know, with the founding fathers. But I also can't help but think about how America became America with guns, particularly as we moved west and all of these other things that some people might have called manifest destiny that people do say this country was one and it was one with force. And the only reason I bring that up is because in committee when we heard this bill and you know, we're getting the statistics on people of color are buying more weapons and you know, women are buying more weapons. Most people who said that, I specifically asked, I said, why is it that you are arming yourself? And I don't want us to miss that in this conversation. I heard some, someone literally said because of the trail of tears. Someone literally said because of police presence in my community. Someone literally said because I don't know if I'm safe if I play my music too loud. And so what I'm concerned about is that is the argument as to why people need to stay armed. Then I would like to have discussions as to why people want to stay armed. Because when I bring it up, it's, I'm, it's called something, something, something theory and books are banned. But yet we want to own that is, you know, that pe more people of color are being armed. And I also want to bring this up because we don't, we aren't having the conversations. It seems like the answer, because to be clear, sometimes the black community does have meetings, sometimes we do have a meeting, okay? But the times when we talk is when our church, we're at Bible study and someone walks in with hate in their hearts and they shoot. We talk when our grocery stores are shot at and targeted. We actually did have a meeting with police department in my neighborhood because if there is a black neighborhood in Denver, it's in mine, and we had to ask what should we do to keep ourselves when we go to the grocery store. We did have a meeting on that. But the answer can't be, I need to pack my gun so when someone shoots me at church, I can shoot them back. The answer can't be, when I go to the grocery store, I need to have my gun so I can shoot them back. That is not prevention. That is reaction. And so I bring that up because we have also talked about what does prevention mean and how can this bill help it? Well, I do want to have those conversations about hate without being shut down because I tell you what a word means in my community. I do want to have a conversation about helping young people avoid gang violence. I do want to have those conversations, and I have sponsored those bills. I do wish they were bipartisanly supported. I am opening myself up today. I will join you on any prevention bill. I'm taking on school data. I'll support with that. But I was the sponsor of the Office of Gun Violence Prevention. I was the sponsor on ERPO. And you know, we did not get support for those. And we have put a lot of money in law enforcement. In fact, every time I'm in committee, I say I would love Love, love, love for you to give me even $100,000 so kids have some place to go at 10 o'clock at night and play basketball. And so I reject those arguments that the way to prevent crime, because I'm still not convinced it's actual preventing, it is shooting back. We have actually also seen what happens when our lobbies turn into OK Corrals and schools. We have had a school shooting where two children were shot by friendly fire, by the way, and that wasn't like 20 years ago. I have also heard those kids who came up here from my district, from my school district, sit on my couch and say, I have yet to see a bill where you fund a school counselor in every school. Yet, we have put over $60 million into tools for school buildings. That does include in that statute, by the way, funding SROs. No one has done it yet. AML but, uh, Bacon. But also, <laughs> what we can fund, thank you, Madam Speaker, apologies. Thank you, back to the bill. But also, what's important is that we can be able to say to our students, to that very question they asked me in 2012, what are you doing to prevent this? 
And this bill gives us an opportunity to say, we heard you. We heard you the dozen times that you came here from the East Coast, from Vegas, from wherever, to tell us why this is important. We heard you every time you marched up here. We heard you every time you sat and talked across from the school counselor. This is the opportunity for me to say, I am trying to do something about it. This is the first step. A. But Mbappe, I will can you also have one say, minute remaining. thank you, that is what is required. That is that we also need to have like authentic and real conversations about prevention. So I don't believe this bill is going to stop all gun violence. I don't believe this bill is going to stop crime, but I, all the crime. But I do believe that this bill will help if we are also willing to talk about why people don't value each other's lives, how we can talk to young people about trying to solve problems different ways. If we can do that too, it will. And I will be proud to say, I have supported a suite of legislation to get there. And I hope to be proud to say that other people, regardless of their party, are willing to do that too. So that when we come up here and have arguments, we have things to say that we also try and did. So thank you for the opportunity to demonstrate that I have an answer and that I can confidently go back to my young people in my neighborhood and say, this is what we try to do. AML Bacon, your time has expired. Representative Mabry. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Speaker. It's an honor to serve with you. And an honor to serve with you. Members, I wasn't sure if I wanted to come up and speak on this today, because I did give a lengthy speech on seconds. But I did want to address some of the things that I've heard since I gave that speech and some of the things that I've heard today. One of the things I highlighted in my speech was I told a story about what happened in Uvalde, Texas, where there the police officers learned that the man inside the school was carrying an AR-15. And then they refused to confront the gunman. They said there was no way of going in. They said they had no choice but to wait and try to get something that had better coverage where they could actually stand up to him. I heard online, I saw online that people said that I was lying when I said that. But this is well documented. There are security camera videos, security camera videos from the school that show the police officers not going in there and saying this. There are videos of the police officers vomiting because the children's bodies were destroyed by these uniquely dangerous weapons. In Aurora, when the shooter walked in that theater and opened fire, and in less than 90 seconds, shot up a room full of people, that cannot be done with a knife. That can't be done with a knife. This is a uniquely American problem. A Seventh Circuit judge, when remarking on how dangerous these weapons are, said that they're uniquely dangerous when shot at children because the surface area of their organs and arteries are smaller. We've heard even from people who support this legislation or who are opposed to this legislation about how these bullets spin when they hit you. And then the wound is larger. These are uniquely dangerous weapons. They should not be on our streets. And the desire to own these specific kinds of weapons does not outweigh the freedom of our children to feel safe to go to school. And we cannot expect students to endure this kind of fear and pain all in the name of the desire to people to own these specific weapons of war designed for death and destruction. If it can shoot up a theater, if it can shoot up a classroom, if it can give one person the ability to blow apart dozens of people in seconds, we should ban the sale of it in Colorado. Another thing I want to remark on is, you know, we've heard a lot about mental illness in this conversation. And of course, of course, the people who commit these atrocities are mentally ill. Every country is home to people living with mental illness. The United States is the only country in the world that experiences mass shootings 
daily. Other countries have similar levels of mental illness. None have the level of mass shootings that the United States do. I also just want to note, you know, there's been some commentary that other countries experience this like we do, but, and I've heard other members talk about their travels around the world. I've, I've also traveled quite extensively around the world, and one thing that is noteworthy to me is our reputation for being a country that has massive amounts of gun violence. In early 2020, before the pandemic, I worked in um, Nepal on a human rights project with some Nepali lawyers, and, and in getting to the, know them, that's one of the first things they brought up with me about living in the United States, was our unique problem with gun violence. The United States has the highest level of gun violence across developed nations with a gun homicide rate, 26 higher than that, 26 times higher than that than pure nations. Mass shootings, in the United States account for 73% of all 139 incidents that have occurred in developed countries between 1998 and 2019. This is a uniquely American problem. We can't take our kids to school. They're not having mass shooter drills in Italy, the UK, Germany, France. They're also not having drills about mass stabbing events or people driving trucks through streets, those incidents don't happen at the same level of frequency that mass shootings happen. This is the state where the modern era of the mass shooting began with Columbine. This week is the anniversary of Columbine. This should be the state where we stand up and join others like Rhode Island, Washington, Illinois, Join the call of the President of the United States and the call of the vast majority of voters. I think the last poll I saw, the majority of Republican voters actually support a ban on assault weapons. Um, and we should stand up and adopt this common sense measure and ban the sale of these deadly weapons. Thank you. Thank you. Assistant Minority Leader Winter. Thank you, Madam Chair. We've talked about emails before, and I'll start off with saying in House District 47, the majority of my constituents do not agree with this piece of legislation. They do believe it's, it's an all-out attack on their constitutional rights. And I will not say that's my whole district. There will be some that would agree with this piece of legislation, but I can unequivocally say that the majority of the voice has been loud and clear within my district. And we have talked about the Constitution, and I did swear an oath, just as you all did, to defend and protect the Constitution. On that day, there was no asterisk, there was no carve-out. It was pretty simple, that was the language. I'll reiterate again, I said it on Friday myself and my constituents know what the Second Amendment is, what it stands for, and what it means. The Founding Fathers fought hard for freedom against an oppressive government. It was overbearing, and they knew that the right to bear arms was ultra-important to make sure that we, the future generations, could never land in that situation again. This isn't a Republican issue, this isn't a Democrat issue, this isn't a race issue, this is an American issue. You're right, it is an American issue. And it's an issue of protecting a free state. I've read history and I think sometimes in America we're actually spoiled and we're naive to think that our government could not take a wrong turn. It could take a bad turn. I mean, to say that it's impossible for the government to take a wrong turn as we look at history over time, I'm not trying to be persuasive, I'm just talking about history, and we have seen it over and over again, where a society has been disarmed, and there is mass death to follow. And I don't think that's a point of consternation, a point of argument, it just, it is what it is. And like we said, if we're gonna talk up here, I'm, I'm fine with being blunt about these things, it's not a problem. And the Second Amendment wasn't, 
put in place to go hunting with your family, which that is something that I do and is part of our heritage, but that isn't why it was there. And it wasn't to go to the range and plink targets. It was partially put there to protect your family, but at the end of the day, it was to protect citizens from an overbearing government. And to protect us from attacks from across the world, Speaking of history again, Admiral Yamamoto during World War II stated the reason that Japan would never think about attacking the American homeland is because there would be a gun behind every blade of grass. So it does play a part in that. Whether we want to believe it or not, that's historically factual. You can check it. If I'm wrong, you can call me while I'm standing here. I do want to dispel what I would say some of the myths were when we talk about the language of the Second Amendment, I heard the term well-regulated. Well, we have to look at it in the context of what it meant during that time. And well-regulated meant well-trained. When the founders wrote this, we can't take, that, we can't take out that out of the context of what they meant. And militia at that time was any male 18 years old or older. So within the context, we have to, if we're gonna, if we're gonna talk about that, we gotta look at it in the context of when it was written not how we want to interpret it now. That does matter, and that's historical fact. And one thing I said on the bill before is I was gonna to speak to the things I didn't know, but I was gonna recuse myself from things that I did not know about. And this is not levying any assault, but just a quick little bit of math to make the comment about using these guns because the meat isn't edible. A common hunting rifle in Colorado to hunt big game, you shoot a 30 out six, that's a 165 grain bullet. Most AR platforms have a 60 grain bullet. So saying that if I throw a 45 pound weight at you is gonna hurt less than a 25 pound weight at you to me isn't, just doesn't make sense. That's simple math. I think that that's factual. You can check that as well. Another thing that's kind of frustrating is, is I do appreciate all the groups that come in here, but you all know rep winners usually the first to show, last to go, and there's a lot of nights these same people that come here and lobby against gun asked armed state patrolmen to walk them to their cars because they have guns. And I reserve that right and my ability to protect myself. And also one, one thing I want to bring up is, and I won't point out who, but on the day that we had a lockdown, there was actually members from this caucus that come over and said, oh, we're going to stand over here with you guys because we know... We know. And that was said, you guys, I mean, you can figure it out amongst yourself, but it was said, we're gonna go stand over there because we know. Um, and I think we're at a point where we're gonna stand up here and we're gonna butt heads on this. And I think that there's some points that we're not gonna move from. Now that I've done just a little bit of level setting, what I think is historical, like I said, I'll have this conversation off offline with any of you on the kind of the things that I talked about to try to level set the argument, because I think a lot of what happens is there are misconceptions. I've, I've heard it in other arguments that we lay out misconceptions or we may not be reading a bill correctly, but if we're gonna level set and be fair, I have to be able to level set on those few topics that I talked about, because if we are gonna have good, healthy debate and discussion, we can't interject, you know, if we're gonna claim we're not gonna interject falsehoods, we've gotta do it all the way around. We've talked about protecting kids, and I'm not going to belabor that comment. There's all different ways we've thought about protecting kids, and I think not to look at every single way of protecting kids is disingenuous. We talk about Uvalde. Well, I'll tell you what, if there was somebody standing up, you know, this has actually been brought up, brought up by a constituent of mine. He's a military veteran. He goes, you know, we have a lot of veterans that come home. They're losing their houses. They can't find a job. What if we put them through rigorous mental evaluations and we put them to work standing in front of our schools protecting our children? I think that that would have probably deterred some people when they come up and see some hard dude that had just served two tours in Iraq standing in front of that school. Might have would have deterred it. And a lot of these attacks do happen in gun-free zones. I think that that's historically accurate a lot of times, too, on some of the things that we're facing. And I... I think if we're gonna throw something at solving the problem, I've said it in housing, I've said it on many different fronts, we've gotta look at the whole list of things that we can use, every tool in the toolbox. And I think in a way, instead of solving the problem, and this happens on both sides, we're speaking to single issue voters and we're pushing the political football one way or the other. And then we talk about lived experience in this, bill, in this building a lot. And the Second Amendment and the ability to, 
to use these guns are part of the fabric of my community and my lived experience and my heritage and our heritage in House District 47 and our rule way of life. And I just earlier said, you know, one of the representatives says, well, in our local community, we've already done this. You do you. We'll do us. And it almost feels, like I said earlier, that our heritage and our viewpoints and the viewpoints of our constituents are disposable. We don't hold the numbers, so it's disposable. The Second Amendment is also about protecting life. It's about protecting liberty. And it's about protecting this pursuit of happiness. As a gun owner, I don't walk out of my house every day going, well, I'm carrying this gun so I can shoot back. I, I don't look at it that way. I look at that I want to be able to defend myself. But at the, at the end of the day, we live in a harsh, real world. And to just discredit that, and I don't mean this disrespectfully, anyway, I'd love to sing Kumbaya and you know, skip down the trail together and all of us, but sitting and looking at the harsh reality of the world that we live in, the mental health issues, the crime issues, those are all real issues that have to be in this conversation. And I wish we lived in a utopia, but... People have been killing man since Cain slayed Abel. It's not going to stop. You remove one tool that was said, well, you know, there's not that many stabbings, there's not that many vehicles used. Well, you remove the tool, those will increase. And if this bill doesn't make it out, it will be hit with a multitude of lawsuits, which will spend more of Coloradans' money. AML Winter, you have one minute remaining. Thank you. We talk about hyper-masculinity and masculinity. Well, I appreciate the masculinity of Bunker Hill, Iwo Jima, Normandy, Antonidum, Bull Run. God bless that, because that's why we're all sitting here today, to be able to have this debate. This piece of legend, there's legislation, there's a chance it's going to pass. And the majority of myself, or my constituents and myself, we will stand for the Second Amendment, and we will go ten toes down protecting a piece of parchment. Thank you. Representative Luck. Thank you, Madam Speaker. This bill as we all know, bans the sale, manufacture, transfer of certain classes of firearms. We have heard that in banning that particular commercial activity, the firearms industry in Colorado will lose 80, 85, 90, 95% of its business. If the goal is to eliminate the addition, the legal addition of firearms into the hands of Coloradans, then this bill is perfectly crafted because it will eliminate the supply. It will. Of all firearms, in my view, because if I'm a firearms company, I am not likely to stay in business if all I'm selling are a few accessories here and there, some ammunition. The bulk of my business, likely right now, is written into these pages. It, ironically, though, in eliminating the supply, it is my belief we will be increasing the demand. When I was in law school, I helped to form an entity that monitored genocide and other human rights violations around the world. Why? Because it was our belief, having looked at different examples, that the more quickly, the quicker, we could inform the international community of certain genocides starting to take place, the more likely it was that we could end them. So we monitored them regularly, day after day, all over the world. We sought to develop assets and folks who could help to 
inform us of on-the-ground activities even before the AP had notice. Since that time, I continue to monitor certain populations, certain groups. And I will tell you that even in countries where there are strict gun control laws, people are killed at high rates by firearms. Take the instance of Nigeria. Right now you have hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people who are being displaced as a result of criminal actors, tribes, banditos, different entities that are causing mayhem. And their nation has a very strict, very strict gun control ban, firearm ban. 10 years imprisonment. And yet that nation continues to see the supply increase from three sources the manufacturer in homes, the private manufacturer of them, the stealing from military armories, and the smuggling in. Their people are clamoring for the ability to protect themselves. I have a dear friend who is Israeli. And since October 7th, she has continued to post personal stories of her friends, of her family, who were impacted by October 7th. Representative and Luck, please bring this back to the bill in front of us. Thank you, Madam Speaker, but I will say this is properly on point with the bill in front of us, because as this bill contemplates the departure from over 200 years of legal precedent in this nation, actually more centuries than that if you go to the British Commonwealth, as well as the natural right to self-preservation. Everyone in this building needs to appreciate the consequential nature of pushing the green or red button. And I will tell you, in consistency with the other speakers that have spoken on their stories about other things that have gone around the world, that as I have heard stories of infants being slaughtered on that day by weapons, by weapons, representative, I, will, I will tell representative, you. Representative, we will stand in a brief recess.
The House will come back to order. Representative Luck. Thank you, Madam Speaker. So, the point that I was making was that under this bill, while supply of these firearms will diminish if not be eliminated through legal means, because the black market will most assuredly pop up and, and we will see the, that particular area of, of commerce well under this bill, um, that the demand for these weapons will actually increase. And I was intending to use three particular international examples to prove that point. Jurisdictions that have employed very stringent gun control to the detriment of their people, Israel being amongst them. I meant not to disparage anyone in that particular conflict. I was speaking from my own experience of having read posts and processing that as a mom. A mom who can't imagine what it would be like if someone attacked her home and she did not have the means to protect herself and her child. No different than what we see in Ukraine with an invading force on a random Thursday in 2022 where in that case, the government not only loosened its gun control measures, but passed out armament. We have to understand that the people who drafted that document, that was those Bill of Rights that were ratified in 1791, they gave a lot of deep thought to this question of self-preservation. They were willing to lose their lives over the principle of self-preservation, hence Lexington and Concord. And they read philosophers like Hobbes and Locke. And they chose to abide Locke They rejected Hobbes. They rejected the Leviathan, the tyrannical government that dictated all of these things. But what they didn't reject was the idea of Hobbes that without governance, self or corporate, life is nasty, brutish, and short. We cannot know what our policies will or will not do in full. Sometimes I wish we had the option of creating alternative universes and trying out different things to see how they work. Or that the good Lord would send the angel Clarence to each of us as we're developing our policies and tell us what the world would look like with or without us like he did for George Bailey in It's a Wonderful Life. If this bill... Representative Luck, you have one minute remaining. Thank you. If this bill, through that lens of George Bailey's experience of being able to see what was or would have been had he not existed or not done something, if we were able to examine it that way and if we were able to find that Colorado would be more safe... I would support it. If self-preservation were better preserved through eliminating people's ability to protect themselves through commonly held arms, I would support it. But we don't have that. What we have is history, current events, and human nature. And all of those things tell me my experience tell me that this bill is just going to lead to more harm. 
That is my genuine experience. Representative Luck, your time has expired. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Minority Leader Puglisi. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, appreciate all the conversation around this issue. As you have seen, pretty much my whole caucus has been up here talking about their concerns about this bill. I share in their concerns. Um, I just wanted to bring up a couple of very quick points um, to the good representative from Fremont County's point about supply and demand. I have heard from a friend and a few friends this weekend anecdotally that um, there has been an increase in the sale of firearms um, with this impending le legislation. And I think that has the um, reverse effect of what the bill sponsors are trying to do. Um, second, um, I am also in one of my side jobs um, and have done for a long time estate planning. And I've had a lot of um, calls from my, my clients this weekend asking what the effect on their estate plan would be if this legislation were to pass. Because a lot of them have spent um, years collecting um, these type of firearms and want to be able to pass it on to their children and grandchildren. And um, this bill, as I read it, will prevent that. And then they want to know what they're going to do. Do we have to change their complete estate plan? How do they handle that? What happens after they are deceased? And I think those are some real questions that will create some issues for estate planning attorneys to determine how that works out. And then lastly, I just I want to be clear, um, especially to some of the people who have come in the gallery to watch this today, that as a mom of a 9 and 12 year old who has these conversations with my children, I don't want anyone to think that a no vote means that we don't think um, our children are safe in school right now, um, that we are not afraid that this could happen to us. Um, or as the good representative, I'm going to say from Arapahoe, had um, spoken on Friday about her fear when she drops her children off, um, that fear is real, and I feel exactly the same way. I just, I don't believe that this legislation will make me or my children, any, me feel any better or my children more safe. And so with that, um, I'm a no vote and um, appreciate the dialogue we've had today. Thank you. Madam Majority Leader. Thank you, Madam Speaker. It is an honor to serve with you. And an honor to serve with you. Members, I'm really thankful and grateful for the conversation we've had on this piece of legis legislation. It's an important and difficult topic, and I believe this body has rose to the occasion over the last several days. This has been a very difficult decision for me to make. I believe strongly in the Second Amendment. I've spoken often about why I have a concealed carry permit. As a domestic violence survivor, I think all of you know my story. I've also spoken as to why I own AKs and ARs and why I feel firearms can be necessary for self-defense. You also know that I believe strongly in responsible firearm ownership, which is why I have sponsored several pieces of legislation aimed at reducing gun violence, keeping communities safe, and promoting the safe use, storage, and ownership of firearms. I respect the debate we have heard about this legislation as it relates to the Bruin decision. I also know that significant thought has been put into drafting this legislation with that decision in mind to ensure it passes the test put to us from the highest court in our land. I've also heard claims that this bill will ban most firearms. While I have concerns that the legislation may be too far reaching, I disagree with that argument. The statistics raised in the debate surrounding this bill simply aren't true, and we owe it to ourselves to recognize that given, given the weight of this topic, Members, the community I represent is diverse, as are views of our caucus and the views of Coloradans. The outreach I have received from every corner of my district has been phenomenal, and they support this bill. It's truly wonderful when people engage in what we do here, and it makes me a better legislator in keeping my fingers on the pulse of my district. 
I spent a long time thinking about this vote. I thought about victims of crime. I thought about survivors like myself and their right to self-defense. I thought about children running from bullets in schools and shoppers fleeing from grocery stores. And I've thought about my colleagues in this building who have been personally impacted by gun violence. I recognize there are legitimate uses for these weapons sometimes, but I've seen enough and I must be a voice for what my community is asking for. These weapons are fundamentally a danger to our society and their use to slaughter large number of people quickly make them inherently unfit to be sold in Colorado. Today, I will be a yes vote on this bill, and I thank you. Representative Epps. Representative Epps. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, it has been a delightful challenge and learning experience to serve with you. I could probably say the same, Representative Epps. <laughs> I, could you pass my phone? I rise in support of 1292, and I had not anticipated that I would that my heart would feel light uh, because most of the things I've been reading in recent days have been heavy and dark. And that is where I expected that my, my mind would be, but it, but it isn't. Um, even as I'm about to share something that is kind of heavy itself. So it, July 19th, July 19th of 2012, I had locked in plans and I had purchased tickets. Uh, back then you could buy them online and print them at home. That's how we did it. To a midnight premiere, premiere at the Aurora Century 16 and I was working on a political campaign and working to reelect the president and part of that work was voter registration and in voter registration you go where the people are. And that means you go to clubs and the movie theaters and you take clipboards because we were still a good five years away from automatic voter registration. And some of you know I, I like social media and this, this post I'm gonna read to you is still up, it's still there, I never deleted it. And it's from July 19th, 2012, 7.36 p.m. And I said, I can't believe this knucklehead talked me into waiting for him to see Dark Knight Rises, DKR. If he sneaks and sees it without me, we're gonna fight. That was July 19th and we had tickets and the knucklehead I'm referencing was my then 15 year old son. I don't know if any parents have ever been stood up by your child, but I was stood up by my child. He doesn't remember where he went. Well, he says he doesn't remember where he went instead that night and I fell asleep and I woke up a uh, few hours later to both news and to a flurry of texts because people knew where I was supposed to have been. And that knucklehead and I were okay, of course. And I haven't told this anecdote in this body or in committee because what our colleague in the other chamber and what other members of this body endured that night are actual tragedies and aren't just weird coincidences where we have a ticket stub from a movie that I didn't go and see. But it stuck with me because a bit of there but for the grace of God go I, but also a how dare I, how dare I have the nerve to be okay and upright and not have seen that movie and not do everything in my power to make our movie theater safer for Coloradans. I want to ask you, I want to ask you a question that was inspired by a colleague from one of the Boulder delegation, I wanna ask y'all to consider what was your moment, colleagues? What, what was, which shooting was it for you? And when I say which shooting, I mean which, which one was it when you heard about it and you heard the numbers and you saw the stories that you said, oh my God, we're finally, we're gonna fix it. We're gonna do something. Was it Aurora? Did it hit close enough to home? Our colleague shared some weeks ago that it was driving back from, from college with their either one, two, or three children, and a story came on about Sandy Hook, and they shared with us publicly that they wept and reflected that, oh, we're gonna fix something. I 
It's been suggested to me. I have three and a half. Uh, six minutes and eight seconds remain. Thank you, Madam Speaker. It's been suggested to me, actually told to me directly, both today and otherwise, that folks were surprised, confused, astounded that this bill has gotten this far. And there's a part of me that my instinctive response was, have you met me? <laughs> um, the, the stubborn runs deep in this one. But the real answer is, I know 100%, 100% certainty. Sun is gonna rise and I know we are going to ban, prohibit the sale and manufacture, import, et cetera, of these weapons in Colorado. I know we are. What I don't know is if it's gonna be this bill or if it's gonna be after that next shooting that sets new terrible records. The next shooting that becomes for someone what Aurora was for us or what Sandy Hook may have been. I'm not gonna name the list, but I know that people in this chamber have had a moment like that. I see folks here, actual folks, not just their organizations, who keep coming back. Thank you. I want you to come back for new things is the goal, but thank you. I want to touch briefly on a couple of things that aren't the most comfortable topics for me, but it's worth addressing. One is the Constitution. I know that the good representative from far, 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 far northeast, Denver and I are I mean, two black women with law degrees. How could you possibly tell us apart? Uh, but she has spoken to this body about the Constitution with a, with a, a reverence that I've envied and that I've decided to, to want to own because it hasn't felt that way. I took an oath to respect and uphold the Constitution and I'll stand by the rest of what I said that's gotten so much attention, that, that that oath was not a death pact. The document is not a death pact. That's not what it meant. Law enforcement, I am, am blessed in many ways. We are blessed in Denver in many ways to have the chief of police and the sheriff that we do. When I hear folks say, and they've said and written to me, my sheriff won't enforce this, our cops won't follow this. Ooh, y'all, I promise, telling us that law enforcement doesn't follow the law and doesn't enforce the law is not the flex you think it is. Mental health, it's not a, it's not a discussion about a gun bill if we don't mention it. And I'm going to try to say something that I wanted to say about mental health in other spaces but haven't gotten up quite the nerve because I feel real sensitive about telling parts of my story versus someone else's story. But I think if they've shared it public, I can share part of it in supporting 1292. Y'all, y'all know who's, who's fighting to fund and support and make access to mental health care. And, and that list of folks is not one that is divided by party exclusively. But when we raise that as an issue, just recognize, just peek at your Secretary of State's website and see who is supporting this bill. Because we've heard who, who isn't. But you'll absolutely see the mental health professionals for youth and adults. You'll see, I'm not gonna name their names, but one of the groups that you'll see, and this is the sensitive part, is school psychologists. The professional organization for school psychologists and a school psychologist whose name that I can't and won't say, but whose sister's words are tattooed on my heart, keeps coming back to us every single year because her sister, who's the school psychologist in Connecticut, ran to put her body between children and a weapon that would, whose sale would be regulated in this bill. That's what a school, school psychologist did. That's what the mental health professional did. And the idea that this woman, I think about families and I think we know the character of our loved ones, especially when they throw themselves, as our colleague from Arapaho shared, your student who threw himself in front of someone to protect them. The parent in me would be proud of my baby, but also be like, save yourself. What a tension, what a terrible, 
set up to put people in the position to have to make that decision, and, and I'm going to wrap this up. But I think about that school psychologist and her sister who tells her story, because in the moment of danger, she ran towards the danger. Representative Epps, you have one minute. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And in, in our moment of fear about political retribution or mean things said, it is our duty to run towards the vote, because running to vote is much easier than running into a hallway with a shooter. Others have told you what the bill doesn't and does, does and does not do, and I want to remind you that we need, you know this, we need a federal ban. But we're not going to wait for the federal government to save us anymore than we have to. State bans work, and I rose in support of this, and I'll sit in support of this. Thank you to the folks who keep coming back. Thank you to our colleagues. Thank you for the opportunity, Colorado, to do what we said we would do and to pass 1292 in this instance. Representative Hernandez. Colleagues, I rise today in support of this bill and have chosen as a member of my generation to participate in this bill in this way because you already understand the ways in which I come into this conversation. We understand what the impact of this issue has been. I appreciate my, my co-prime sponsor for mentioning about asking which one because my generation has been asking that question over and over and over and over again. But I'm going to ground us today in a story and experience I've had in the last 24 hours. This week marks the 25th anniversary of the Columbine High School shooting, of the massacre and murder of 13 people, including 12 students and one teacher, a day that we all understand changed Colorado history. And so I want to walk us through that day so that you know what you're voting on. On Tuesday, April 20th, 1999, it was senior ditch day at Columbine High School. At 11.19 a.m., two 12th grade students dressed in trench coats, carrying duffel bags, began shooting fellow students outside of Columbine High School. They go into the cafeteria where they attempt to detonate homemade bombs in the cafeteria, but when their bombs don't go off, they take their second most lethal weapon out. And they begin shooting their fellow students. From the cafeteria, they move into the library. On the way, they're shooting at members of Columbine High School's community where they hit a teacher. And it's in the library where, according to the Denver Post, the day after the shooting, the gunman terrorized over 50 students with bullets. And I want you to remember what happened to those young people. Kyle Velasquez was 16 years old. He was a big teddy bear. He suffered a stroke as a baby, leaving him mentally disabled. And his parents were prepared to spend the rest of their lives with him due to his disabilities. Disabled students, I know, as a teacher, often struggle for social connection. And Kyle loved computers. And he was sitting at a computer table in the library when the shooting began. And he was shot in the back of a head while hiding under that same computer. Isaiah Scholes, 18 years old, wanted to be a comedian. He dreamed of being a music executive, and after graduating, he wanted to attend an arts college. In fact, he played cornerback for the Columbine High School football team, but he quit the previous year because of possible racial intimidation. According to Todd, a 15-year-old sophomore in the Columbine library who survived, he directly quotes the assailants as saying, oh my God, look at this black kid's brain. Awesome, man. Isaiah was the only black student killed during the Columbine shooting, and his brother was a freshman who ran away from the school and got away safely, and the next time he saw his brother was in a body bag. Cassie Bernal was 17 years old and a Christian, and in that same library, her unwavering faith transformed her into a martyr the instant after she was taunted by the gunman 
who asked her, do you believe in God? She responded, yes, I do believe in God. And she was shot and killed. And the story of Dave Saunders is what breaks me because now I am a teacher. Where Dave Saunders, along with two other school janitors, helped more than 100 students out of a path of danger by hurrying them away. He was shot in that hallway and bleeding from two gunshot wounds, he came into the arm of computer tech teacher Rich Long into science room three, three doors down from the library where 60 students cowered inside. Dave began to bleed out, where two students, Aaron Hansey and Kevin Starkey, attended to Sanders on the floor, staunching his wounds with their shirts, trying to keep him awake. Despite 911 instructions from a chemistry teacher in the room, despite a whiteboard placed on the window that was exposed that police departments have concerned, have have said that they have seen that reads one bleeding to death, Dave Saunders, after saving more than 100 children, bled out over a four hour period in front of 60 children on a science classroom floor. I hope you feel what you feel right now, whether it be discomfort or scared or sick to your stomach. I hope we sit with this feeling today Following the Columbine High School tragedy in April 1990, A50KOA created the Never Forgotten Fund. The donations to the fund come with a pin that has 13 Columbines on it and has the words Never Forgotten. The funds go to scholarships, each awarded in the, same, in the name of a life lost at Columbine. And yesterday, I was walking back from the Cesar Chavez March and I stopped in an antique store where I found one of these pins that I'm wearing today. We are at the point in this issue where the people of my generation are finding antique store pins about the worst school shooting to ever occur in the Colorado history. I was two years old when the shooting at Columbine happened and adults who were in this room swore that like the pin said, you would never forget where families begged you to remember people you swore that none of them would be forgotten. And so I did some research on how this legislature has attempted to remember the victims. In fact, in case you don't know, the day after the Columbine shooting on the 21st of April, 1999, this legislature, this house was set to debate gun legislation that would have liberalized the concealed carry regulations in the state of Colorado because of the massacre. The work was canceled for the day and the bill was PI'd. 10 days later, this body in the House releases Joint Resolution 991058, where it quotes, we must join together to search for answers to prevent tragedies such as this from happening again. And this body had the audacity to send it to every victim's family. 10 years after on the 10th anniversary of Columbine, House Joint Resolution 091019 was read and successfully passed where it quoted, we have worked on legislation that was enacted to create an environment free of bullying. And again, we sent a copy to the family of every victim of the shooting. In 25 years, since the worst shooting ever to occur in a school in Colorado history where you felt sick to your stomach, we still allow the weapons used to massacre children in a library to be sold. We still allow our cultural infatuation with guns to permeate our lives at any moment. The massacre at Columbine was recognized as the deadliest and worst school shooting in US history until it happened in an elementary school at Sandy Hook where 26 children were killed in 2012. Until it happened again in Parkland in February 2018 and 17 students died on Valentine's Day. Until again, it happened in Uvalde in Texas and 21 elementary school kids, including a little girl who wore green shoes, died because of proliferation of these weapons. I asked this body today, have you forgotten? I ask us if we're gonna choose to forget again. If we have not, as I hope we haven't, 
I hope we let this, fur this feeling burrow deep down into our souls. Commit to what you as adults said you would do when this happened. Commit to what we as a legislator said, legislature said that we would do in the last 25 years, where in 1999, we said we commit to beginning the dialogue to prevent violence in schools. And then in 2009, we commit to efforts that have been made throughout Colorado and the nation to understand how this tragedy happened and to prevent similar tragedies from occurring. Representative, you have 50 seconds remaining. I ask us to commit, colleagues, to never forgetting as begged by community members, family members, and children themselves over 25 years and every year since. I ask you never to forget about Kyle, about Isaiah, about Cassie, and about a teacher named Dave. So that this year, we don't send a copy of a resolution intended to do about their tragedy, what we intend to do, but that we can hand them a copy of this bill and prove to them that in fact, we did not forget. I ask for an I vote, and thank you. Seeing no further discussion, the motion before us is the adoption of House Bill 1292 on third reading and final passage. Mr. Schiebel, please open the machine and members proceed to vote. Speaker pro tem degree Kennedy, how do you vote? Yes. Speaker pro tem degree Kennedy votes yes. Representative Velasco, how do you vote? Yes. Representative Velasco votes yes. Representative Ortiz, how do you vote? Yes. Representative Ortiz votes yes. Representative Evans, how do you vote? No. Representative Evans votes no. Representative Soper, how do you vote? No. Representative Soper votes no. Representative Lynch, how do you vote? No. Representative Lynch votes no. Representative Bottoms, how do you vote? No. Representative Bottoms votes no. Representative Herod, how do you vote? Yes. Representative Herod votes yes. Please close the machine. With 35 aye, 27 no, and three excused, House Bill 1292 is adopted. Co-sponsors. Speaker pro tem degree Kennedy, co-sponsors. Representative Herod, co-sponsors. Please close the machine. Mr. Schiebel, please read the title to House Bill 1152. House Bill 1152 by Representatives Amabile and Weinberg, also Senators Mullica and Exum, concerning increasing the number of accessory dwelling units. Madam Majority Leader. Madam Speaker, I move House Bill 1152 on third reading and final passage. The motion before us is the adoption of House Bill 1152 on third reading and final passage. Representative Amabile. Oh, Representative DeGraff. Okay, more on the assault of towards, moving towards the abolition of private property, ADUs. We talked about this for a long time. We're, 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 cramming, we're cramming property in where we don't need to. We've got a housing situation that the market is taking care of. And our goal with two of our bills today is Max, ma maximizing the density of housing into what and to what avail? What are we trying to accomplish here? We've already demonstrated that the housing units, the housing areas that we have don't have the infrastructure either for water, electricity, or sewer. And we're looking at, we're looking at doubling the number of occupants in a street. Five to 800 square foot ADUs is what's uh, said in here every property able to put one on, so doubling immediately. Then you take 1007 and you say, well, you don't have any, you can't, you can't limit the number of occupants to that home unless you can prove it's a safety issue. So now you're not just doubling, you are 
You're putting it at some level that we don't even know. And the, and the electrical, just in case you're wondering, if you want to do anything like, if you want to do anything like upgrade a panel, it's going to cost five to fifteen thousand dollars to upgrade from. 100 amp to fit uh, for 200 amp and you can't really go any higher than that without taking out the uh, all the way to the street and then you're going to say well we, now we're going to we're going to mandate the electric vehicles well we know that's not really true because the design this whole process is that nobody will have vehicles so this this entire <coughs> charade now this bill, as we uh, talked about previously, does specifically, and these are, these are mentioned in the, uh, the governor's climate roadmap to nowhere. And, this is the, and these are the bases. You know, we talk, about, we talk about air quality. Air quality gets worse when you pack people into a very small area. You could talk about studies like mouse utopia. Mice in overcrowded situations tend to develop serious pathologies that make them become more and increasingly socially dysfunctional. An experiment in a 10,000 foot pen could have easily sustained 5,000 rats, could have easily supported 10,000 rats, fewer than 200. And rats are used, mice are used in psychological studies all the time. They're obviously not exactly like people, but what we're talking about is we're talking about putting mice, rats, into a utopian situation, and they don't thrive. They just don't. It's not, it's not good for populations, but that's what we're trying to, that's what we're doing. Everything is, is going towards this, this max density. And if you look at the, uh, the dysfunctional characteristics of that, they, that they go to, it's, it is very indicative of the society that we live in. So the whole goal, not only is it untenable, it's unwise, and not only is it unwise, but it's unscientific. We use this as a basis and say, well, this is gonna accomplish our air quality goals. It won't, because you pack more people into a smaller area, you don't have trees, you don't have open space, your air quality gets worse. It's just the way it happens. So obviously, that's not really the problem. And I sent this letter out yesterday because I continue to be baffled by the no amount of non-science and nonsense that goes on in here. And so I'm just going to go through this. Because we have some, we have some superstition, and I say that lightly because this, the, the, the carbon superstition is well below anything like black cats or walking under a ladder as far as viability. So here's the science. And I forgot to bring them up. I can go get them for another time. But when I asked what the science goals were, when I asked the director of the Colorado Energy Office what it is that we're basing this on, he didn't know. Instead, he pointed me to four bills, four bills that were sponsored. So I contacted all of the sponsors of those bills and asked them very specifically, what are the state's climate goals? How will carbon dioxide achieve them? How will carbon dioxide reductions achieve them? Some of you got those CORA requests. Some of you honored them. None of you, none, had any idea what the scientific goals were. Representative DeGraff, I just want to bring us back to 1152. Perhaps Thank you, Madam Chair, but this does talk bills. specifically about our carbon goals as we established last time. As a basis for, as a basis for doing these type of laws, and if we're going to do these laws and we're going to say this is a basis, then we should be we should be comfortable with talking about the basis. So here's the science. Get out your calculator. Carbon dioxide contributes less than 10 percent to the greenhouse effect. That is just a fact. You can round it up to 100 percent if you want to. It doesn't really change anything. Humans generate 35 billion tons annually. There are over 3,200 billion tons in the atmosphere. 
I'll get to these. So these are just the facts, and you can falsify them if you want. That's what they're for. That's what I've been trying to do. I've been trying to get somebody to engage and falsify the facts. Because what you're doing is you're imposing and you're saying something about science and it has no science basis whatsoever. Which makes the imposition of these types of laws purely arbitrary. They might be good intentions, but the road to hell is paved with good intentions. The U.S. generates 5 billion tons. And guess what? The U.S. has decreased 1 billion tons in about the last 10 or 20 years. In that same time, India and China have increased by, by taking on our manufacturing as we offshore our jobs to accomplish these type of regulations. They've increased by 10. So for every one that we have decreased, they've increased by 10. So whatever we decrease is offset tenfold in the wrong, is in the other direction. Now it doesn't matter. Carbon dioxide again is less than 10% of the greenhouse gas effect. Over 300 million people live in the United States. So if you do the math, 10 out of 100, 35 over 325 over 35 th over 300 million, that is less than one trillionth. Your carbon footprint, grossly exaggerated, is less than one trillionth of any greenhouse effect, any impact on the climate. So you are looking, so this legislation is looking to actively saddle Coloradans with an additional $10,000 per person per year debt. And what will it achieve besides the virtue preening of this body who knows absolutely nothing about the science of climate? It will achieve less than one part in one trillion. And how much is a trillion? A trillion drops at 20 drops per milliliter, if you remember that from chemistry, would be 20 Olympic-sized swimming pools full of drops. 20 pools. So your carbon footprint is the equivalent, the, the, the carbon footprint of Colorado that is being used to justify these types of laws where we're going to start packing people in is less than one drop in 20 Olympic-sized swimming pools full of drops. So when I say that this, these type of bills, this type of legislation that will saddle Colorado with $10,000 per person per year is absolutely arbitrary. It's ignorant, it's irresponsible. And nobody in this body seems to want to engage in that because they know they can't. So the only reason that you can say that you're, this is gonna happen? Representative DeGraff, I'm sorry. I have now heard accusations of falsifying data that people don't know anything about science and you have called people ignorant. So I'm gonna ask you to bring it in just a little bit. We can appreciate your point on the carbon data. I'm sorry for taking up this time, go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. No, I don't, I don't think they've falsified the data. They haven't looked at any data. Representative DeGraff, also you have now 35 seconds remaining. So all I can say is to the people of Colorado that this is being done, this is government being done to you, not for you. It's just another example of that. So the government will be continued to be done to you over and over and over again, as long as this nonsense continues. Thank you. Representative Frizzell. Thank you. Um, I spoke quite a bit about this bill yesterday and uh, obviously and ran amendments. This bill is very interesting. I find it interesting because it, it does create an interesting, uh, a conundrum, if you will, uh, of property rights versus local control. I believe in property rights and I believe in local control. I do not, however, believe that the state plays a role in this decision. I don't believe that it should be the purview of the state to weigh in on this. 
you've heard me talk about ADUs from the context that we allow them in Castle Rock. But the town has also created some, what I believe are beneficial guardrails around that so that one property owner doesn't necessarily, their choices don't infringe on their neighbor. I ran a couple of amendments around water because this bill is decidedly silent on this topic of water capacity. And I, I heard the bill sponsors that they created amendments around what is appropriate They, well, and I guess that's probably not even correct. It's actually deferring to uh, consistency with master plans and compa compatibility with land use or development of the area surrounding. And I guess that that um, could be considered a catch-all. But um, I, I don't believe that others felt that this went far enough. They wanted a definition, they wanted wording in this bill that was specific to water capacity and availability and wastewater capacity and availability. Um, the, the, the amendments that I ran were at the behest of the Colorado Water Congress. They felt that it was important to have that language in the bill. Um, I was disappointed in the dismissive way that that topic was treated. But here we are. This is a bill that grows government. It adds headcount to DOLA. It adds... To, uh, duties to DOLA, but it also uses taxpayer dollars to incentivize behavior. Uh, I, I firmly believe, and this is true in Castle Rock, that if someone wants to build an ADU, whether it's for their mother-in-law or to rent out, that's fine. If they do it in the right way, that's fine. But I don't believe that the construction of ADUs should be incentivized by the state. I don't think that that's our role. There's obviously benefit if you own a home and you want to construct an ADU, you will receive financial benefit from renting it out or benefit from the perspective of you have your mother-in-law to help watch your children. There's lots of different reasons. I don't think that this is something the state needs to be weighing in on. We did talk about parking yesterday and that in this bill it says a subject jurisdiction shall not require the construction of a new off-street parking space in connection with the construction or conversion of an accessory dwelling unit. Um, I, I did ask specifically if there was a conflict between this legislation and HOA requirements or municipal ordinances that that this would be um, that 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 homeowners insurance or sorry the homeowners association rules would prevail and and I'm and I'm glad about that but you know Castle Rock is is not downtown Denver we don't have transit in Castle Rock and so perhaps. That is okay in Denver, but it's, it's not really um, workable in all areas of, of the state that are affected by this legislation. I think it's important that we do things right. 
in this room. Again, I am not opposed to ADUs. I'm not opposed to transit-oriented communities. But I am opposed to the state weighing in on this, and I am opposed to state dollars being used to incentivize this type of development. I am a no vote. Thank you. Assistant Minority Leader Winter. Thank you, Assistant Majority Leader. My big issue with this is the local control issue. Um, as we talk about it, the infrastructure, I worked in infrastructure business for a while. I, I think this causes a problem, creates a problem with infrastructure. Um, I know that I worked in the wastewater field for a bit, and this is definitely a talk we had about all the time about up, upgrading infrastructure, upgrading underground infrastructure, upgrading wastewater plants. And those of you that are involved in local government, you know how hard it is to keep up with those things. I'm also looking at things like water supply and the infrastructure from that and being able to supply these utilities that we send out and be able to make sure that we can do it effectively, be able to make sure that we can do it consistently. I think that's important. So it will put, I mean, in a way, I think that this piece of legislation is putting the cart before the horse if the community doesn't have the water lines, doesn't have the sewer lines, doesn't have the energy, um, definitely takes a toll on the, a toll on the parking. Those are things that are definite problems. These are things that could run crossways with what this piece of legislation is trying to do. On top of that, we're adding high density living, which is also a strain on utilities infrastructure. And we're taking money from taxpayers and holding communities hostage unless they follow these types of legislation. The state is effectively taking control of how these communities want to grow and where they want to grow and how they do it. As of right now, this isn't a huge issue within my district, but as my district grows, I can see that this becomes an issue. And for those reasons, I need to you know, stand up and speak for my constituency, say that this is a problem that we don't want to face. We work hard in our, you know, from Pueblo all the way out to Kiowa County, we work hard at trying to plan and project what our communities are going to look like and the way we want them to look. And I definitely don't think that the strong arm of the state should be able to come into southeastern Colorado and tell us how we do things. So for those reasons, I urge a no vote. Thank you. Representative Catlin. Thank you, Madam Chair. It's an honor to serve with you. Thank it's you. an honor to serve with you. Thank you. Members, I'm... I'm here, I, I wanted to speak to this real quickly. In the communities that I represent, the lots that are gonna be big enough to accommodate ADUs are in the older part of town. The newer parts of town have smaller lots that will probably not accommodate an ADU. And in these communities, if we get a surge of ADUs in Block A or Block 17, hooking up to the sanitary, to the sewer line, he's gonna put an, ex, an extra load <clears throat> in those facilities. And five years out from now, if, we, if this looks to be something that people are wanting to do, some of these areas in those communities are gonna have such an increase in usage, not only of water, and let's talk about water, those water delivery systems are old too. So is the electrical in, the, in, the, uh, in my communities, in, in the uh, alleys, how the electricity comes in, along with the sewer line, which is out in the main street. I'm concerned that we may be creating a problem for these communities down the road five years, maybe, we'll just pick a number, five years. Well, these communities are not on the water and power list for the grants to replace this type of thing. There's 132 communities on that list right now to help with that. The other problem that I see is that if we are going to grow like that, 
Downstream of these problems will also be the water treatment plant. Most of those are pretty much to capacity on the western slope right now. In fact, a number of my communities are on the list to get grants in order to increase capacities. We are growing on the western slope too. So I, I'm wondering if we've thought this through to the point where what will we do, the state, in order to accommodate <coughs> these facilities not being capable of handling that capacity? Because then it falls back to the community rather than to the person who built the ADU in their yard. It, you know, it, it looks good when you drive down the street. You think, man, this could work. This would be a great idea. If we put these in these backyards, it could really, it could really make a difference. And yes, it might be able to. But shouldn't the communities get ready to do that before we do it? Because when we talk about planning, we're talking about out in front of us. Planning should not be that we have to hurry to retrofit neighborhoods and, and main lines, trunk lines, and all of the other facilities that the city manages and operates. I think we ought to think about this for a little. I'd ask for a no vote. Thank you. Representative Amabile. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. So um, it's been a long day so far, but we wanted to come up here and talk about the way that this bill got run and all of the work that got put into this bill. And we wanted to express gratitude for Eleni from the governor's office, who can't be here with us today. And to say to her and to all of you that Two years worth of effort on her part has gone in to making these land use bills a reality. And she has done an incredible job. She is an amazing human being. And we wouldn't be here today without her help and guidance. And we are wishing her the best and hoping that she will get her butt back here <laughs> soon. Representative Weinberg. Thank you, Madam Assistant Minority Leader. It's truly a privilege to work with you. Fellow colleagues, this bill, as I'm sure you're all aware, as I get surrounded by Democrats, <laughs> you can have one come up. <laughs> was, <laughs> was a difficult one, but again, my sentiments to Eleni, who's I'm sure watching right now, we love you. And we're truly grateful and, and thankful for you and everything you've done and all the work that you've put into this because it's been literally timeless. Thank you. And vote yes on this. <laughs> Representative Joda. Thank you, Madam Assistant Majority Leader. Um, Eleni, we know you're watching. And from one Mediterranean girl to the other, um, we are sending our love, and I know for everyone here, we quickly bonded over land use in tears, but also debating who makes baklava better, <laughs> the Arabs or the Greeks, and the jury's still out, but I promise that next time I see you, we will have that tasting and have a democratic ruling. So. Incredibly grateful for you, and we love you. Thank you. I, I hope Baklifa is in the bill. This is not quite to the bill. We're going to provide this latitude. Representative, Representative Woodrow. It is third reading. Thank you, uh, Madam Speaker Pro Tem. And I, in my five years, have only come down on third reading twice. Um, I make it a habit not to do that. But I have to say thank you, Eleni. Uh, for your work on this. The people of Colorado deserve to know how hard you fight and how, just how much you have everyone's back. We have your back on this fight. We thank you, we love you, vote yes. To the bill, 
hopefully Representative Majie. Thank you, thank you, Madam Maybe. Chair. To the bill, Eleni, all of your work on this bill and for every effort you have taken, um, housing Coloradans, focusing on housing for all Coloradans, thank you, you are a champion and this bill in particular will make a big difference towards housing our communities, but of course all the other work and we can't wait for you to get back. Thank you. <laughs> Representative Holtorf. Where are you going, buddy? Come back. Um, so I just found out that the person that is being referenced, did work on this bill substantially and is also going through some medical treatments. Had a respect for that. I apologize if I made a comment to the group that was up here. I did not know about that. And I think that I would have liked to know and I wouldn't have made the comment I made. So I just want to, uh, and thank you Representative Mabry for coming and talking to me and letting me know that that was the situation. Um, now, I'm gonna talk to the bill and I want to preface this by saying this doesn't directly affect at this time my district in the seven counties of rural House District 63. But there is a dangerous precedence that I want to point out that continues to be a problem. And many years ago in a previous life I did serve on the Washington County Planning and Zoning. Uh, commission in my home county. At, in that responsibility as appointed by the county commissioners, we had the responsibility of, of um, number one, following the county's um, master plan and making sure that every application and permit did come in line with that uh, plan for growth that the county commissioners had developed working with the planning and zoning commission. And also everything that was presented was reviewed and then a recommendation was made to the county commissioners for approval because we had no authority. We had a recommendation that we would make to the commissioners which they would review and then they would approve or deny approval for that development. So here's where I really have an issue with this. And I understand that everyone's trying to solve problems, housing problems specifically. And there are housing problems in rural Colorado also, in our small communities, as this state grows exponentially. But the real issue I have here, and I'm gonna read, the bill requires a subject jurisdiction to allow, subject to an administrative approval process, these uh, accessory dwelling units, one, as an accessory used to a single unit detached dwelling in any part of the subject jurisdiction where the subject jurisdiction allows single unit detached dwellings. The bill also prohibits subject jurisdictions from enacting or enforcing certain local laws that would restrict the construction uh, or conversion of an accessory dwelling unit. So the first problem I have is with the prohibition. As that prohibition ties to local laws or local authority or local land use or local control. You see, once again, as a body, we are stepping on local land use. Now many proponents of this bill will say, well, we have to, we have to, because we need more homes or we need more places for people to live, whether it's your mother, your grandmother, your son or daughter who can't get a job and is still living at home or whatever, because you don't have a basement or whatever. But here's the real problem. I push back on the premise that we 
should be and should supersede local control and local land use. And that we should be passing laws with these prohibitions. So you're essentially taking away a city, municipality, town in my case, um, county of my seven counties. Now you're taking away their authority. And they're elected by their citizens to promulgate the authority and control that's given to them in developing their communities. I think it's wrong. I don't think it's right. Fundamentally, it should be a bottom-up process. Fundamentally, the state should be augmenting and supporting counties and municipalities. Fundamentally, it is not our jobs, nor the governor's job, or any working group, or anybody who has this great, grandiose idea of land use. It's not their job to step on and oppress any entity below their level. Any more so than it is the federal government's right to step on states' rights under the 10th Amendment which I respect. Now, some of us look to this side of the chamber and see the Gadsden flag. Don't tread on me. I will tell you there are local land use... <clears throat> well, I'll read here. There are local land use. There are counties and municipalities. When you pass this bill, send it to the next chamber. If it gets through the next chamber and goes to the governor's desk, they will say, don't tread on me. And when you sign this and enact it in a Colorado Revised Statute, you will be treading on them. You will tread on them. That's what that has to do with this bill. Nobody wants to be told how to do their business or live their lives. Nobody wants to be told that they cannot do something or, or there's a prohibition against doing something. You're forced to do this. Now, earlier I talked about uh, a little historical lesson. In the colonial days when the citizens were forced to house a British soldier in their home, and they refused and did not want that, they were punished. They were told they had to do something. You have to do this because... King George says do it. To the bill, Representative. Thank you. So to this bill, we have the state now, but potentially, this is the governor's uh, staff has been working on this. The bill sponsors have been working on this, arguably, for a long time now. And we're going to force this on Colorado. It wouldn't matter if it was dog um, hutches or if it was chicken coops or if it was... Uh, anything for anything or anybody. If you were told you had to do it and could not have a prohibition against it, whatever it was, I think it's wrong. Now, I understand the need for housing. I understand that. But my objection, Madam Speaker, and my objection, dear colleagues, is the prohibition and the fact that now you are taking away, this isn't the first one today, Okay, you're taking away the right of municipalities, towns, cities, and or counties and their land use master plans. Now you are saying you will change them. In the language in this chamber, you shall change them because we say so. Now in a previous bill that I won't speak to, there was actually very significant punishment this one just says you can't do it. Now, I could be wrong, so I'm gonna allow the bill sponsor to come up here. But when you put these restrictive, prohibitive, the language in these Holtor, statutes. if you have one minute remaining. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I think it is very authoritative in nature. It is very over the top. It's a top down, a top down when it should be a bottom up process. And you are forcing your will upon your subordinates. 
subordination being municipalities and counties and their land use. And I don't think that's right. So I will be a no, even though this doesn't directly affect my district that I'm aware of. But it could when it's extend, expanded, perhaps. You know, it, it may be expanded in future time to some of my counties or my municipalities. But anyway, I do have an objection to this. I will be a no on this bill, and thank you for your time. Representative Weinberg. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And fellow colleagues, there's a reason, there's literally a reason the majority of the mighty 19 are not down here fighting this one, and that is because this is private property. Private property. If I purchase something, I should be able to do with it what I wish. ADUs, something as simple as ADU, where in the city of Loveland it does well, has been endorsed by major organizations in northern Colorado, which is why I joined my colleague from Boulder, Representative Amable. This is a good bill. I won't drag it out since it's Sunday. I truly want to bring it back to what a few of us did a moment ago, which is, Eleni, our heart is with you. I appreciate you very much. And I would ask everyone to vote aye. Seeing no further discussion, the motion before us is the adoption of House Bill 1152 on third reading final passage. Mr. Schiebel, please open the machine and members proceed to vote. Speaker pro tem degree Kennedy, how do you vote? We will come back. Oh. Yes. Sorry for the delay. Yes. Speaker pro tem degree Kennedy votes yes. Representative Velasco, how do you vote? Yes. Representative Velasco votes yes. Representative Ortiz, how do you vote? Yes. Representative Ortiz votes yes. Representative Evans, how do you vote? No. Representative Evans votes no. Representative Soper, how do you vote? No. Representative Soper votes no. Representative Lynch, how do you vote? No. Representative Lynch votes no. Representative Bottoms, how do you vote? No. Representative Bottoms votes no. Representative Herod, how do you vote? Yes. Representative Herod votes yes. Please close the machine. With 43 aye, 19 no, and three excused, House Bill 1152 is adopted. Co-sponsors. Representative Ortiz, co-sponsors. Please close the machine. Madam Majority Leader. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I move to lay over House Bill 1158 until tomorrow. Uh, House Bill 1158 will be laid over until tomorrow, Monday, April 15th. Mr. Schiebel, please read the title to House Bill 1351. House Bill 1351 by Representatives Amabile and Lindstedt, also Senators Lundin and Priola, concerning the continuation of functions related to banking and a connection therewith, implementing the recommendations in the 2023 Sunset Report from the Department of Regulatory Agencies for the Division of Banking and the Banking Board. Madam Majority Leader. Madam Speaker, I move House Bill 1351 on third reading and final passage. Seeing no further discussion, the motion before us is the adoption of House Bill 1351 on third reading and final passage. Mr. Schiebel, please open the machine and members proceed to vote. Speaker pro tem degree Kennedy, how do you vote? Yes. Speaker pro tem degree Kennedy votes yes. Representative Velasco, how do you vote? Yes. Representative Velasco votes yes. Representative Ortiz, how do you vote? Yes. Representative Ortiz votes yes. Representative Evans, how do you vote? Representative Evans votes no. Representative Soper, how do you vote? No. Representative Soper votes no. Representative Lynch, how do you no. vote? No. 
Representative Lynch votes no. Representative Bottoms, how do you vote? No. Representative Bottoms votes no. Representative Herod, how do you vote? Yes. Representative Herod votes yes. Please close the machine. With 44 aye, 18 no, three excused, House Bill 1351 is adopted. Co-sponsors. Please close the machine. Mr. Sheeple, please read the title to House Bill 1294. House Bill 1294 by Representatives Basenecker and Velasco, also Senator Cutter, concerning mobile homes that are located in a mobile home park and in connection therewith, specifying legal rights and responsibilities relating to the sale, lease, and purchase of such homes and making an appropriation. Madam Majority Leader. Madam Speaker, I move House Bill 1294 on third reading and final passage. The motion before us is the adoption of House Bill 1294 on third reading final passage. Mr. Sheeble, please open the machine and members proceed to vote. Speaker Pro Tem Degree Kennedy, how do you vote? Yes. Speaker Pro Tem Degree Kennedy votes yes. Representative Velasco, how do you vote? Yes. Representative Velasco votes yes. Representative Ortiz, how do you vote? Yes. Representative Ortiz votes yes. Representative Evans, how do you vote? Sorry. Representative Sorry. Evans Sorry. votes no. Representative Absolutely. Soper, how do you vote? No. Representative Soper votes no. Representative Lynch, how do you vote? No. Representative Lynch votes no. Representative Bottoms, how do you vote? No. Representative Bottoms votes no. Representative Herod, how do you vote? Yes. Representative Herod votes yes. Please close the machine. With 44 aye, 18 no, and three excused, House Bill 1294 is adopted. Co-sponsors. Representative Ortiz, Herod, co-sponsor. Please. Yes. Assistant ML Bacon. Please close the machine. Mr. Schiebel, please read the title to House Bill 1344. House Bill 1344 by Representatives Leader and Ricks, also Senators Pelton B. and Fields, concerning the continuation of the State Plumbing Board and in connection therewith, implementing the recommendations in the 2023 Sunset Report by the Department of Regulatory Agencies. Madam Majority Leader. Madam Speaker, I move House Bill 1344 on third reading and final passage. The motion before us is the adoption of House Bill 1344 on third reading final passage. Mr. Schiebel, please open the machine and members proceed to vote. Speaker Pro Tem Degree Kennedy, how do you vote? Yes. Speaker Pro Tem Degree Kennedy votes yes. Representative Velasco, how do you vote? Yes. Represent Representative Velasco votes yes. Representative Ortiz, how do you vote? Yes. Representative Ortiz votes yes. Representative Evans, how do you vote? No. Representative Evans votes no. Representative Soper, how do you vote? No. Representative Soper votes no. Representative Lynch, how do you vote? Yes. Representative Lynch votes yes. Representative Bottoms, how do you vote? No. Representative Bottoms votes no. Representative Herod, how do you vote? Yes. Representative Herod votes yes. Hartsuk, Hernandez, Wilford, Winter. Please close the machine. With 52 aye, 10 no, and three excused, House Bill 1344 is adopted. Co-sponsors. Please close the machine. Mr. Schiebel, please read the title to House Bill 1377. 
House Bill 1377 by Representatives Marvin and Young, also Senator Cutter, concerning court-appointed special advocates who work with youth in the Foster Youth and Transition Program. Madam Majority Leader. Madam Speaker, I move House Bill 1377 on third reading and final passage. The motion before us is the adoption of House Bill 1377 on third reading final passage. Mr. Schiebel, please open the machine and members proceed to vote. Speaker Pro Tem Degree Kennedy, how do you vote? Yes. Speaker Pro Tem Degree Kennedy votes yes. Representative Velasco, how do you vote? Yes. Representative Velasco votes yes. Representative Ortiz, how do you vote? Yes. Representative Ortiz votes yes. Representative Evans, how do you vote? Yes. Sorry, Representative Evans, was that yes? Thumbs up, that was a yes. Representative Evans votes yes. Representative Soper, how do you vote? Yes. Representative Soper votes yes. Representative Lynch, how do you vote? Yes. Representative Lynch votes yes. Representative Bottoms, how do you vote? Yes. Representative Bottoms votes yes. Representative Herod, how do you vote? Yes. Representative Herod votes yes. Please close the machine. With 62 ayes, zero no, and three excused, House Bill 1377 is adopted. Co-sponsors. Representative Ortiz, co-sponsors. Please close the machine. Mr. Schiebel, please read the title to House Bill 1232. House Bill 1232 by Representative Snyder, also Senator Gardner, concerning the enactment of the Uniform Special Deposits Act. Madam Majority Leader. Madam Speaker, I move House Bill 1232 on third reading and final passage. The motion before us is the adoption of House Bill 1232 on third reading final passage. Mr. Schiebel, please open the machine and members proceed to vote. Speaker Pro Tem Degree Kennedy, how do you vote? Yes. Speaker Pro Tem Degree Kennedy votes yes. Representative Velasco, how do you vote? Yes. Representative Velasco votes yes. Representative Ortiz, how do you vote? Yes. Representative Ortiz votes yes. Representative Evans, how do you vote? No. Representative Evans votes no. Representative Soper, how do you vote? Yes. Representative Soper votes yes. Representative Lynch, how do you vote? Yes. Yeah. Representative Lynch votes yes. Representative Bottoms, how do you vote? No. Representative Bottoms votes no. Representative Herod, you are no longer online. Is that correct? If you are there, please speak out. Please close the machine. With 52, uh, 53 I, 8 no, 4 excused, House Bill 1232 is adopted. Co-sponsors. Representative Soper, co-sponsors. Please close the machine. Mr. Schiebel, please read the title to House Bill 1378. House Bill 1378 by Representatives Lindstedt and Valdez, also Senators Sullivan and Gardner, concerning consumer protection in event ticket sales. Madam Majority Leader. Madam Speaker, I move House Bill 1378 on third reading and final passage. The motion before us is the adoption of House Bill 1378 on third reading final passage. Mr. Schiebel, please open the machine and members proceed to vote. Speaker Pro Tem Degree Kennedy, how do you vote? Yes. Speaker Pro Tem Degree Kennedy votes yes. Representative Velasco, how do you vote? Yes. Representative Velasco votes yes. Representative Ortiz, how do you vote? Yes. Representative Ortiz votes yes. Representative Evans, how do you vote? Yes. Representative Evans votes yes. Representative Soper, how do you vote? No. Representative Soper votes no. Representative Lynch, how do you vote? Yes. Representative Lynch votes yes. Representative Bottoms, how do you vote? No. Representative Bottoms votes no. Please close the machine. With 54 ayes, 7 no, and 4 excused, House Bill 1378 is adopted. Co-sponsors. Representative Ortiz, co-sponsors.
please close the machine. Mr. Schiebel, please read the title to House Bill 1383. House Bill 1383 by Representative Lindstedt, also Senator Michael Sinjane, concerning declarations that form common interest communities under the Colorado Common Interest Ownership Act. Madam Majority Leader. Madam Speaker, I move House Bill 1383 on third reading and final passage. The motion before us is the adoption of House Bill 1383 on third reading final passage. Mr. Schiebel, please open the machine and members proceed to vote. Speaker pro tem degree Kennedy, how do you vote? Yes. Speaker pro tem degree Kennedy votes yes. Representative Velasco, how do you vote? Yes. Representative Velasco votes yes. Representative Ortiz, how do you vote? Yes. Representative Ortiz votes yes. Representative Evans, how do you vote? Yes. Representative Evans votes yes. Representative Soper, how do you vote? No. Representative Soper votes no. Representative Lynch, how do you vote? No. Representative Lynch votes no. Representative Bottoms, how do you vote? Yes. Representative Bottoms votes yes. Please close the machine. With 59 aye, two no, four excused, House Bill 1383 is adopted. Co-sponsors. Please close the machine. Mr. Schiebel, please read the title to Senate Bill 137. Senate Bill 137 by Senators Simpson and Gonzalez, also Representatives Martinez and Holtorf, concerning the planting of uncertified potatoes and in connection therewith requiring that certified potato seed stock be tested and approved by the Certifying Authority of Colorado before planting. Madam Majority Leader. Madam Speaker, I move Senate Bill 137 on third reading and final passage. The motion before us is the adoption of Senate Bill 137 on third reading final passage. Oh. Mr. Schiebel, please open the machine and members proceed to vote. Speaker pro tem degree Kennedy, how do you vote? Yes. Speaker pro tem degree Kennedy votes yes. Representative Velasco, how do you vote? Yes. Members... That seems fair. <laughs> Members, we are trying to get through the votes. The machine is open. I do need for you to keep your voices and laughter down. Uh, Representative Velasco, how do you vote? Yes. Representative Velasco votes yes. Representative Ortiz, how do you vote? Yes. Representative Ortiz votes yes. Representative Evans, how do you vote? Yes. Representative Evans votes yes. Representative Soper, how do you vote? Yes. Representative Soper votes yes. Representative Lynch, how do you vote? Yes. Representative Lynch votes yes. Representative Bottoms, how do you vote? Yes for today. Representative Bottoms votes yes for today. Please close the machine. With 60 aye, one no, and four excused, Senate Bill 137 is adopted. Co-sponsors. Representative Ortiz, Velasco, Soper, co-sponsor. Lynch, co-sponsors. Thank you, members. We do have one segment of business left to tend to. Madam Majority Leader. Madam Speaker, I move to proceed out of order for consideration of conference committee reports. Seeing no objection, we will proceed out of order for consideration of conference committee reports. Representative Byrd. Madam Speaker, I move for the adoption of the first report of the first conference committee on House Bill 241430. My apologies, members. Uh, we do need to read oh. the title. Mr. Schiebel, please read the title of House Bill 1430. 
House Bill 1430 by Representative Byrd, also Senator Zenzinger, concerning the provision for payment of the expenses of the executive, legislative, and judicial departments of the State of Colorado and of its agencies and institutions formed during the fiscal year beginning July 1st, 2024, except as otherwise noted. And Representative Byrd, I'll have you make that motion again. All right. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I move for the adoption of the first report of the first conference committee on House Bill 241430. Uh, please proceed. Thank you. Uh, so, Madam Speaker, this is the culmination of our work uh, to complete the budget after having g gone through the process here in the House, um, looking and reviewing the amendments made here, and looking at what amendments were passed also in the Senate. Um, your members of the Joint Budget Committee worked together to marry the best we could with the resources we had available and uh, proceeded to hear you out and add additional funds for affordable housing construction grants. We added more funding for the school security disbursement program, crime victim services, senior services, specifically the area, ag area agencies on aging. We added additional funding for the Tony Gramsas Youth Services Program, the Immigration Legal Defense Fund. We increased medical services funding for maternal and fertil fertility care and primary care also increased funding for the Colorado Access to Justice Cash Fund, and adjusted funding for several decision items within the Department of Public Safety to make additional resources available um, for our bills. We also added funding um, to support CSU's AgriBility Program and um, funding for the Cannabis Business Office. Um, and that is a summary of our work. So I would be uh, grateful for your support. Representative Bradley. Thank you. And a huge thank you to the members of the JBC who made it very clear that school safety is important to all of us. I appreciate you wholeheartedly for giving back and letting schools decide what makes them safer. Thank you. Seeing no further discussion, the motion before us is to, con is to adopt the first committee Conference Committee Report for House Bill 1430. Mr. Sheeple, please open the machine and members proceed to vote. Speaker Pro Tem Degree Kennedy, how do you vote? Yes. Speaker Pro Tem Degree Kennedy votes yes. Representative Velasco, how do you vote? Yes. Representative Velasco votes yes. Representative Ortiz, how do you vote? Yes. Representative Ortiz votes yes. Representative Evans, how do you vote? Yes. Representative Evans votes yes. Representative Soper, how do you vote? No. Representative Soper votes no. Representative Lynch, how do you vote? No. Representative Lynch votes no. Representative Bottoms, we do not see you on the screen. If you are present, Representative Bottoms is excused. Please close the machine. With 48 aye, 12 no, 5 excused, the motion to adopt the conference committee report to House Bill 1430 is passed. <laughs> Madam Majority Leader. Madam Speaker, I move for the repassage of House Bill 24-1430 as amended by the conference committee report. The motion before us is the repassage of House Bill 1430 as amended by the conference committee report. Mr. Schiebel, please open the machine and members proceed to vote. Speaker Pro Tem Degree Kennedy, how do you vote? Yes. Speaker Pro Tem Degree Kennedy votes yes. Representative Velasco, how do you vote? Yes. Representative Velasco votes yes. Representative Ortiz, how do you vote? Yes. Representative Ortiz votes yes. Representative Evans, how do you vote? No. Representative Evans votes no. Representative Soper, how do you vote? No. Representative Soper votes no. Representative Lynch, how do you vote? No. Representative Lynch votes no. Please close the machine. With 44 aye, 16 no, and five excused, and we're slowing down for a photo op. 44 aye, 16 no, and five excused. House Bill 1430, as amended, is repassed. Co-sponsors. Good job. Please.
Please close the machine. Madam Majority Leader. Madam Speaker, I move to lay over the balance of the calendar until Monday, April 15th, 2024. Seeing no objection, the balance of the calendar will be laid over until Monday, April 15th, 2024. Madam Majority Leader, any announcements for us? <laughs> Madam Speaker, I move the House stand in adjournment until Monday, April 15th at 10 a.m. See no objection. The House will adjourn until tomorrow, Monday, April 15th, 10 a.m.